Championship Wrestling. Bringing you great wrestling action. Sanctioned by the NWA, National Wrestling Alliance. Championship Wrestling from March 5th, 1988. And I do stress NWA World Championship Wrestling because every promo, it seemed, plugging the Crockett Cup, they're plugging the Clash, and they're sure to plug the National Wrestling Alliance. The, the, they're phasing out the words Jim Crockett Promotions, and it's all about the NWA now. It opened with clips of Barry Windham challenging Mike Rotunda for the TV title. Dude, hold on a second. Where the hell are my notes for this show? Don't even tell me they vanished. I had them put together with NXT, and now there's no N- NWA notes. Have I lost my mind? I I only have I don't have your computer. Are they the top of the file? Oh, there the they are. Okay. For some reason, when I sent it to myself, it only sent the NXT stuff, even though it's in the same report. Odd. You're telling me. Hmm. All right. So clips of Barry Windham challenging Mike Rotunda for the TV title. And I thought to myself, you know, three years ago, these two guys were the tag team champions of the first WrestleMania. And it's wrestling. And specifically, you know, I was thinking of WWF for the WrestleMania part. And I thought to myself, they will never acknowledge this. And then Barry Windham comes out and talks about his past with Mike Rotunda. Obviously, it doesn't specifically talk about wrestling in WrestleMania, but since they have a long history together, a long relationship with each other, known them for a long time, and now it's come to an end thanks to Kevin Sullivan. And they go to the finish of the match. First of all, the ring's legit broken. Yeah, the ring apparently broke earlier in the match, mm-hmm. but then there was a superplex that may have made it worse. But So, so the posts are shaking. They're running around and doing stuff. The the mat is waving like the mighty sea. Yes. <laughs> it waves and, and... The ropes are loose. But they're still doing stuff. They're doing everything. He should have blamed that on Kevin Sullivan. Sabotage the ring. You broke the ring. I could have had Tried that title one. Yeah. So the Varsity Club attacks with the DQ. And first... I says later. They, they, they attack with the DQ. And then they pull out a coat hanger. And they're choking Wyndham with a coat hanger and dragging him to their dressing room. And the arena is set up so there's an entrance way on either side of the ring, and one goes to the good guy's locker room, and one guy one goes to the bad guy's locker room. So as the dragon wind him down their aisle, Luger has to hit the ring, go through it, come out the other side to make the save. So he does, he makes the save, Barry Windham's still alive. Barry cut this one of his rare I can't say it was a great promo. It was better than most of his promos. It's much better than most promos, but he still had to really think about what he was going to say at all times. Mm -hmm. There were long moments of silence. He said, I never saw this footage until today. I could only assume that Kevin Sullivan was the man who wrapped that clothes hanger around my neck. But I've seen that footage now, and it was not Kevin Sullivan. It was Mike Rotundo. He didn't outright say it, but he basically said he tried to kill me. He said you tried to do a lot more than in my career. That's right. Our relationship, it was dear to me and my family. Mm -hmm. Now it's over. Now that you tried to kill me. He says, if I ever find you, Kevin Sullivan, it ain't going to be like a wrestling match. I'll follow you home. And if I ever get my hands on you, Rotundo, I'm going to make sure you never do anything like this to anyone again. I don't think Rotundo ever did anything like this to anyone ever again. So. <laughs> Not to Barry. Yeah, Barry sure. must have uh, solved that problem. I think this is Barry Windham doing his best Dirty Harry impression for this promo. Great. Yeah. Do whatever impression you got to do to not suck. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good lesson to all young wrestlers. Thank you. Do whatever you must do to not suck. By the way, they opened up plugging this Clash of the Champions. Mm-hmm. For those of you unaware, this Clash went head-to-head with WrestleMania. Yes. It was revenge for the Starcade Survivor mm-hmm. Series deal. Where WWE put on Survivor Series opposite Starcade, mm-hmm. both on pay per view. Yep, told the they were they were gonna go at separate times, so that it would not be an overlap. But then WWE told the cable companies, anybody that airs Starcade, you will not be able to air WrestleMania. So all but like six mm-hmm. cable companies around the country did not air it. Of course, one did air it in San Jose. Luckily for Dave. <laughs> so they've watched. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, this was their revenge. They're, they're... A free Clash of the Champions, head-to-head with WrestleMania four, mm-hmm. that fucking tournament. Yeah. And it did great. It sure did. And they plugged the shit out of it, which is a lesson here. Yeah. Plug yeah. the shit out of your shit, and it may do well on television. <laughs> you heard so me. So they had two, actually had two, at least two shows to plug throughout this one. The Clash of the Champions, of course, and the Crockett Cup is in April. Yes. So that was the focus of everyone. Uh, the Horseman came out for this promo. Tully's talking about a chance to win a million dollars. 
Dylan says there's going to be great teams competing from all over the world. You have to win four matches against good teams to win this whole th- whole thing, unless if you can nail down a top seed and get a bye and only have to win three times. So the seeding is very important now. Yes, it's, very, very important. It's a free win in a very competitive tournament. So were Arn's pair of glasses he was wearing. <laughs> what the fuck were these? <laughs> I don't know. They were so horrible. They weren't even like cool aviators or whatever they wore in the <laughs> 80s. They were just a shitty pair of glasses. So Arn says Wyndham and, take him seriously. Wyndham and Luger are the favorites in a lot of people's eyes, but they still have to go out and prove it, and he promised they would shine in the cup. And honestly, this is not a great horseman promo either. Not, no, by, not by their standards. It was okay. Yeah. Oh, Shane Douglas and Gene Ligon. They do this, Vinny, with baby faces. They sure do. They go out there. I, they do a shit ton of arm drags. I have seen my fill. We've had well, three years now of these retro shows. Maybe two, yeah. two and a half, whatever. I am done with 1980s babyface squash matches. You know what's funny the, is... The young, pretty boy, technical skilled squash match. I'm, I've had my fill. I used to do all these matches with Buddy back when my Uncle Wayne used to go to the shows. And fuck, did he hate arm drags. Remember that? Oh, your Uncle Wayne. Yeah. Yeah. He'd be screaming, no arm, fuck those arm drags, blah, blah, blah. And he's always just ranting about arm drags. I don't remember this. I was was like, we don't do that many arm drags. Mm -hmm. He must have just grown up watching Crockett. He might have. Because if I ever see a fucking arm drag again. Arm drag, arm bar. Arm arm drag, drag, arm bar. Run up the ropes, arm drag. Lots of smiling. A lot of smiling. Big high cross, guy kicks out, arm drag. Let me talk about that. Because there's five minutes of arm drags and arm bars, and I'm bored out of my skull. (laughs) And there's a point where Shane gets whipped into the corner, and Gene Ligon charges, and Shane ducks to the apron to evade, so Ligon hits the corner and, and, and bumps. And Shane then runs to the opposite top rope while pumping his fist running the apron. Yes. And he hits this giant high cross, and I said, this will all be worth it for this finish. And then Gene Ligon kicked out, and they did more fucking arm bars. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Eventually. I, it was boring. Eventually, and he won with the belly to belly. Shane won with the belly to belly. I do have to say that Shane Douglas. Okay, so first we got to talk about this promo. <laughs> we do. We absolutely do. David says we need to talk about you, Shane. You've been training with Magnum, and you're getting in great shape. And we can see it here. He, for, he got a whole promo for Shane. Yes. Shane should have said, "You're right," and left. Shane then begins <laughs> by calling him Magnum Pi. He says Magnum P.I. I've been training with Magnum P.I. and like Magnum P.I. Yeah. <laughs> a and, famous show from the fucking 80s. Yeah, it was on TV. Well, it's where Magnum T.A. got where his Magnum name. Where Magnum T.A. got his name. So he but says, I mean, come on. He says Magnum P.I. And he, we, we watched this several times. And I'm, I'm still not sure we agree. Because he says Magnum P.I. And he stops and he looks to the side. His, his expression doesn't change. He never reveals it. But I'm pretty sure he knew, holy shit, I just said Magnum fucking P.I. Well, he had to know because he corrected it almost immediately. Oh, he said Magnum T.I. almost immediately. everything that he was doing that you're describing, he was doing throughout the entire promo. He was off Smiling, his Smiling, looking all over the place through the whole thing. He never really got back on the ball here. No. He, he, he fucked up his first sentence and never really recovered. He says the talent here is unsurmountable. <laughs> unsurmountable. It's not a word. Yeah. Going live on TBS is unprecedented. Hmm. And anyway, he plugged the champ, class of champions, plugged the Crockett Cup, and said he and Ricky would be in the in the oh, tournament. God Almighty, what a fucking team! Ricky Santana, if you're wondering, because he didn't clarify. Yeah, just him and Ricky. Happy babyface Shane Douglas is the most fucking bizarre thing I've ever seen. After maybe if we go back and watch some of those shows where the Sandman was a surfer, that'd be more <laughs> fucked up. But I'm not sure. Well, or, what would be weirder, happy, plucky, baby face Shane Douglas, Sandman with a surfboard, or Tommy Dreamer in suspenders? It's got to be Douglas. <laughs> it might be. It's just got to be. He's like this for years. He's like a tag team of Steamboat and stuff, too. It's just bizarre. For, for a long time, he was plucky, baby face Shane Douglas, before he became angry, foul-mouthed, bitter Shane Douglas. A total reversal. Hey, speaking of angry, bitter Shane Douglas, Rick Flair came out for a promo. Ric Flair buries Greenville, South Carolina. And they buried Louisville. And Greenville. As you are, he did bury Greenville, too. Yes, which is incredible in hindsight because the scene of his greatest moment, arguably in the history of his career, was Greenville, South Carolina. Yeah. That big return on Nitro. Yes. So, first of all, because they're doing a show in Louisville. That's the third show I was trying to remember. So, he, of course, is from North Carolina. He likes the Tar Heels and J.R. Reed. He does not like the Louisville Cardinals and Purvis Ellison. 
WTBS, he explains, the top station in the world, and my title defenses are a bigger deal than Hawks baseball or Hawks basketball or Braves baseball. Ted Turner is spending millions of dollars, he says, on making sure this event blows away anything else going on that day. So, of course, he needs Ric Flair to main event such a giant show. He says, I'm main eventing a Sting on that show, and yeah, I'm facing Sting a half dozen times between now and then, and I might lose the title to him, but I guarantee you I'm walking out of the clash with that belt. Yeah. It was, a, shockingly, a fun Flair promo. I just love that this new thing is not that Sting can't beat him. Just but that he'll lose in the end. He could beat him, but he'll win it back. Flair has lost, lost him regained the title several times now. Yes. Flair is very good at falling off that horse and getting back up. Yes. The best. He really was, actually. Mike Rotunda versus Ricky Santana. This was just like that Shane Douglas match, but longer and more boring because it was longer. See? They just kept going and going. They did it, well, they did a 20-minute draw. Oh. <laughs> Dude. See, I thought this was way better than most Ricky Santana matches, which are just like most Shane Douglas matches, because at least Rotunda would get out of the hold once in a while, and you get right back in it. You do some bug-eyed selling, but at least they were doing stuff. I'll tell you the one thing I liked about this match. It's actually the finish. Mm-hmm. So this is not... A, so Rotunda's a champion. Yeah. Ricky Santana's a challenger. Correct. This was not a match where the challenger is about to win when the time limit expires. No. Instead, Rotunda is beating the shit out of him, and he's in, a, he's in the middle of a two count when the time limit expires. That's what goes on. And The I'm- story here, the story was not that Ricky Santana was the better man, but Rotundo eked out a retention via time a, a, limit. A draw. draw. He, yes. Santana survived the time limit. The story was that Mike Rotundo, who is the champion, by the way, is the better man. But Ricky Santana merely being able to survive 20 minutes. He was not finished. It was a moral victory. I think it was Ross. Whoever's doing the play-by-play just screams, Ricky Santana didn't get beat. Yeah. Which is what happened. I like that. That's I, that's different. It is different. It it's is totally different than the way they normally do these things. That is true. Hey, you know what else is different? Kevin Sullivan is now a Satan-worshipping college athletics coach who also wears a bondage mask for no reason. There's a reason. He's Kevin Sullivan? Yeah. Okay. That's fair. And you know what else? You know what else I liked about this finish? I don't know if they meant to do this or not, but this was like a prelude to the Sting Ric Flair 45 minute draw. I suppose it was. Yeah. Might have been. So, Wyndham by the end had come out to cheerlead for Santana and make sure Sullivan didn't interfere anymore. And uh, they do the draw, time expires. Wyndham hits the ring. He starts brawling with Rotunda and Sullivan. Now, he's holding his own against two of them. But then Rick Steiner comes out, and now he's done for. Shane Douglas runs out to try to make the save. Sullivan just dismisses of him like a complete loser. And then Wyndham makes his own comeback anyway. <laughs> you cannot have designed this anymore to make Shane Douglas look like a bigger geek. Uh, Dusty Rhodes comes out for a promo. He's got his... Showing off his $2,000 custom $2, cowboy do- boots. <laughs> okay, for, in order... He announces, or it's announced, that at the Clash, it's going to be him and the Road Warriors versus the Powers of Pain and Ivan Koloff in a barbed wire match. Which will air. Which will air on live TV. Yes. Yes. Then, to one-up Ric Flair, because he must always one-up Ric Flair, he has to show off his $2,000 custom-made cowboy boots. Then he moves on to Baby Doll. She's trying to slander my name, but Larry Zabisco will still have to beat me for the U.S. title. As this, Why is the storyline still going on? <laughs> Hell if I know. Slow build. He talks about the Varsity Club without any point. Says he's been working with terrible Ted Turner for 12 years. This is going to be their biggest show yet. And then he promises. Can I? Have at it. Did you write it down? Not word for word. He says, if you don't watch Clash of the Champions, I am going to come down your chimney on Christmas Eve and choke all of your snot-nosed kids. And he howls and he walks off screen. That's what he said. You know what the best part of this is? No. This is 1988, and this was massively controversial at the time. I'm sure it was. I just laughed my ass off. Dusty Rhodes threatened to come down the chimney and choke, and choke Paisley he, he if I didn't watch the Clash of the Champions. He specified, too, at Christmas time. Yeah. So he was being a plot of revenge for eight months. Well, he's fat. <laughs> he's going to be Santa Claus. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
So it's coming down to a very mean Santa Claus who chokes not nose kids. I laughed my ass off because <laughs> it was clearly meant to be a joke. He's he can't even keep a straight face through the whole thing. But like everyone's sending fucking letters to TBS. <laughs> so absurd. Like why is Dusty threatening to choke my child? Yeah. Well, yeah. Cause it's a joke. <laughs> Sting versus Chance McQuaid from some arena somewhere. Sting quickly won with a stinger splash at Scorpion. Yeah. Jim Cornette came out for a promo. He flapped his gums for a while, said they were all ready to throw a party when the Midnights are named the number one seed in the Crockett Cup, and if they are not named the number one seed, then he and his mama and their lawyers are going to sue. You missed the line where Cornette comes out and says, David, I got some bad news for you, and no, it's not your AIDS test. God, I did miss that. I missed that entirely. Yes. Where was I? I don't know, but huh? there was a lot on this show that I'm sure got some letters sent. How about that? Yes. Barry Windham versus Gary Phelps. Okay, listen. Seriously now. I tried wrestling for a while. I wasn't very good at it. Among the reasons, I didn't have a very good physique. So I covered my physique, especially my flabby pecs, with a full torso singlet, as much coverage as I could get, right? If you have flabby pecs, and you're going to be on national television, why would you get a singlet that has just two thin straps coming up that just accentuates your man boobs? Because he's Gary Phelps, dude. Gary Phelps is out there jiggling all over the place. He's got bigger boobs than baby dolls on the show. They do a spot early where they lock up. And I don't know what happened. I think I think he tried an arm drag or something like that. They cut to these two hot 80s women in the crowd. Dude. And literally, they look at each other and they start laughing. They're, I imagine they're laughing at his arm drag. The, the best thing is they do this and they cut to him. Their hair is massive. Oh, yeah. It takes up the whole screen. <laughs> Giant Aquanet hair. It's beautiful. So beautiful. Barry beats him in like a minute with, with the lariat, and they go to super slow-mo, and you can watch Barry... Uh, uh, what's his name? Gary Phelps. Yeah. Just jiggle all over the place as he's running them ropes. So no, Cro- I won't go back and watch that. No, I don't recommend it. Crockett interviews Zabisco and Baby Doll. So this Baby Doll... Best. <laughs> Baby doll in response to Dusty Rhodes showing off his cowboy boots. She's out there in heels, but she is carrying knee high snakeskin boots. And she says, I think she says they're twenty five hundred dollars, clearly better than Dusty's. And then Larry just goes off. First of all, on national television, Dusty Rhodes has just admitted to choking children. Yeah. He He's, says, not only do we have pictures on Dusty, but now he's here admitting to being a child beater. He's a child beater. Now, I believe you once had Larry on your show and he was out of his mind. Oh, yeah. Turns out he's been out of his mind since 1988. Yeah, but he's a good talker. He's a great talker. He's so awesome. He's, I don't know what his point was, but he was on a spiel about nuclear energy, overpopulation, I swear to, swear to God, the fall of the Christian elite. Yes. And then the end of the world. Yes. But he says all of this is going to be okay, because in the end, he knows he and Baby Doll are going to wind up on top. This was a... This, this is was, awesome. This was a reference to... Uh, what's his face last week? Swaggered? Swagger. Jimmy Swagger. Oh, fall of the Christian elite. Yeah, he says that Dusty and Jimmy Swagger should start their own magazine, Repent House. Repent House. Fucking... I died. Dusty's supposed to be the baby face. He's threatening to come down my chimney and choke Paisley. And not denying that he's banging women on the side. Yeah, this fucking guy comes on screen. He notes that this crazy guy is threatening our children. He, we've got these photos. The story, How is Larry the heel? The storyline is Dusty Rhodes is a philandering child beater. Yeah. And Dusty's admitted it. He's bragging it. He bragging is. about it. Then Larry Zabisco wrestled Randy Hogan. I like this Randy Hogan. Randy Hogan, I believe we mentioned he stole Randy Savage's first name and Hulk Hogan's last name and hairstyle. Did we mention he also and trunks? St- he stole Ric Flair's gear. No, Hogan used to wear that baby blue. Yes, he did, but th- in the eighties, Randy Hogan has the classic flair. It's powder blue trunks, navy blue knee pads, and teal boots. Okay, the Harley Race outfit down to down to the detail. I like him. He's fun. We need it, more Randy Hogans in this business. We need more Larry Zabiscos too. Yeah, Larry beat him and beat. It's been a long time. Nothing really happened. Like never- Roman Rollins. Wouldn't that be a great jobber? Yes. <laughs> In fact, it would. <laughs> now I just want to make up names all night. Oh, man. Braun Owens. Yeah. So Rock Cena. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so this went on a long time. It never got boring, but nothing of no happened. And Larry won with a neckbreaker. Yes. The spam slam of the week was Sting hitting hitting a stinger splash on John Savage. 
Tony Schiavone, professional play-by-play man, called this a flying move. Yeah. Well, it was. It was. Not wrong. Lex Luger, Luger comes out in pleated, acid-washed gray jeans. Yeah. Amazing. I got to talk about the beginning of this promo. Lex Luger says, people often ask me, why wrestling? Why did you quit football to do professional wrestling? You know what Lex Luger says when people ask him that question? He says, it's because of special events like Starcade and the Crockett Cup. So anyway, hopefully Vince McMahon can invent some special events from football because mm. that's what the sport is missing, Vinny. There are no special events. Well, there are, but they're not special. I see. What, what do they call There's a new name for pay-per-views now. Network special, maybe? Yeah. Maybe, yeah. And they're not special. They're network shows. Yes, I'm talking for football, Vinny. There oh, need football. to be some special events for football, not just games. I see. Okay. Yes. Okay, you, you, you... Carry on with your advice on how the NFL should market itself. Yes! So... I'm being sarcastic, you fucking moron. I That's see. his answer. I see. There's no special events in fucking football, so he turned to pro wrestling. I see. I thought you... I, I can't believe I'd explain that to you. I thought you were criticizing WWE. No! Okay. I'm talking about how stupid that answer was. I left football for pro wrestling because there's no special events in fucking football. I see. Even I know that. Fair enough. So he plugs Sting's title match against Flair. He plugs the barbed wire six man match. He pulls off his shirt. He talks talking about sweating. Yeah, he didn't no, even have a match this week. Nope, nope, nope. Starts pushing other matches. Talks about all the crowd support he and Wyndham gets. Then he gets back to Flair and promises he'll beat him someday. Oh, the jive tones. <laughs> they were in rare form this week. I knew. I not knew, but my, my favorite train wreck every week. Tremendous amount of jiving. So, first first thing is funny. It's Keith Steinborn and Ryan, Ryan Wagner are the opponents this week. The the jive tones are out there. This show's been on for an hour now at this point. Every once in a while, they will cut to close-ups of the crowd. Usually, they try to find hot babes. Sometimes it's, a, it's an excited child. But if you had watched this show and watched all these close-ups, you would not know there were any black people in the stands until the jive tones come out. And suddenly, every close-up you see, a new black person. So, Shaska's out there. He's doing a cool drop kick and an even cooler dance. And Keith Steinborn. It's like, terrible. He's never any good. This no. had to be his worst match. Well, he's in with the jive tones. That's, well, yeah. Tiger but, Conway Jr. was terrible. He was fucking awful. He but, was horrible. But they, even, I mean, there's, you can get whipped into the corner and take, and by you, I mean anyone within the sound of my voice, you can get whipped in the, into the corner and hit a knee better than Keith Steinborn did in this match. Of course you can. He couldn't run the ropes. He was dead waiting. They're in there trying a double suplex, and it's all of the, both of them can do to get this guy up. At last, it is time for the finish. Oh. <laughs> so You could not have done this worse. <laughs> Jive Tone's finish is actually two moves. They do a double stroke, like Jeff Jarrett, but there's two of them. Just think a double front Russian leg sweep, and then a double side Russian yeah. leg sweep. It's not like one move leads into the other. They all go crashing frontwards, then they all got to get back up, and they all go crashing backwards. It's wretched. And this... the 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 the, the <sighs> like double leg sweep Im- sweep implies we will both do a move to you and then all three of us will go down that is not what happened Shaska went down he's dragging Steinborn down Steinborn drags Conway down on top of him yeah Conway falls on the guy everything about this sucked Keith Steinborn I haven't done this in a while worst wrestler of all time of the week wow he was bad thank god the G1 is over <laughs> The only thing I've been watching is the not even all of the G1. Just the great stuff? The best of the G1. Mm-hmm. I watched the G1 until 2 a.m. or whatever last night. Mm-hmm. Tanahashi and Ibushi. One of the greatest matches I ever saw. Now I got the Jive Tones versus Keith Steinborn and Ryan Wagner. This is not as good. It's not even the same business. It's not. They're not even doing the same things. No. Then this promo. This was a great promo. It and you know what? Yes and no. <laughs> no. They actually made a great point. Shaska Watley noted, Animal went to the hospital. Yes. That proves anybody can be whooped around here. He did say that. It's fucking right. He's exactly right. And everyone's vulnerable. So first, Tiger Conway talks. It's uh, They got their jackets and hats back on. They got their jackets on, and hats and bow ties back on. So, of course... 
he has to mention that uh, Tiger Conway does that they got some advice on Doug Williams and how to win championships. Doug Williams, Brian, a few months before this was the first black quarterback to win the Super Bowl. I thought he was talking about the English. He was not, in fact, talking about the mm. suplex master from the UK. No. So he's going and he's ranting and he's ranting. And finally, Shaska has to like physically grab the mic and pull it away so he can get some TV time. So Shaska's time to talk. He's a better talker anyway. He takes his point to bad animal. He's going off on Dusty Roads, all these other teams in the Crocker, Crocker Cup. And suddenly, Tiger starts talking again. And he's, he's shouting, but he's not on camera or on the mic, but you can hear him shouting. So he steps in frame. He's basically talking over Shaska into the mic. I can only assume at some point when the lights were off and the cameras were not running, Shaska Watley beat the fuck out of this guy. Because every week he's out there taking up Shaska's time. This is not a, this is bad chemistry, but it makes for great TV. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. And then you, Brian, left the room for this entire next match. I left the room, and I thought the Varsity Club segment. I should be back for the end. I wasn't, but I all of a sudden hear you just explode in laughter upstairs. Mm-hmm. I can only imagine what I missed. Rick Steiner and Kevin Sullivan. Absolutely massacred Alan Martin and Steve Atkinson. So I should go back and watch this? I would recommend everyone should watch it. I, really? I would say I would say I would say this is the best squash match in who knows how long, but the answer was last week with Ronnie Garvin. I was gonna say, was that, it better than that? It was not better than that. Okay. But it was great. I mean Rick Steiner is a big scary man. We've seen him rough some dudes up. Yeah. He was nothing compared to Kevin Sullivan here. <laughs> Sullivan's chopping dudes and clobbering and and sla- slapping them and throw them outside and kicking them. Grabs a chair, just... Ooh, I don't even know which guy it was. He just smashes some guy in the back with his chair. He's just beating the fuck out of them. Steiner's in there. He's doing, like, reverse tombstones. <laughs> just dropping guys in their head. Suplexing dudes through the air onto their head. And finally, Sullivan whips Martin into the ring. Or into the ropes. He punches him in the head. And he pins him. This was glorious. Sounds awesome. This is an absolute massacre from bell to bell. This is why I watch Saturday night shows, to see geeks destroyed. Then they cut their promo. It's incredibly wacky, even by their standards. Sullivan dares Barry Wyndham to come to my house. You're scared for your life, Barry Wyndham. Come, go ahead and come to my house. I'll, I'll be waiting for you. It says everyone else is out here bragging about their $2,000 shoes and their $2,500 boots. He point against the camera of Mike Rotunda's feet. These are $5 shoes, because shoes don't matter. He's plugging the Crockett Cup. He's plugging the Clash. All these other teams are going to go extinct, like the Mastodons and the Dodo Birds. And finally, Rotunda takes over, and he says, Barry Windham, I don't want to hear you cry anymore. This is all over between us. I'm the champion, and you're not. This is also fun. Road Warriors versus Bob Riddle and R- Rick Orossi. He actually wrote Rock Orossi, which is not right. So Animal's first match back from his uh, orbital bone injury. He has a hockey mask on. They put his face paint on the a hockey mask. hockey mask. mask. Yeah. All I know is it looked awesome. It sure did. It looked so good that I was like, why did you did ever he go wear back? that for the rest of his career? Yes. It looks great. They destroyed these goofs, one in 30 seconds. And the finish was, they did the Doomsday device, and an Animal press slams one geek onto the other, just with no concern about which body part's landing on what. Yeah. This is a human form landing on another. They go to cut their promo. Animal says the NWA is forcing him. Hold on a minute. First, he has to explain to us why he's wearing a mask. Yeah, maybe somebody wasn't paying attention. Are you kidding me? It's been the main story of the show for weeks. As soon as I said that, I realized how stupid it was. I gotta wear this mask, he says, because of my eye. I'm like, no shit. Then he starts plugging the barbed wire match, and he goes, I'm not worried about it because of this. Like, so... This is going to protect all of this? Sure. Then Hawk says, Yeah, I've been throwing hockey pucks at Animal all day long. Hasn't bothered him. This was a very wacky promo. It was. They both went from the most serious promos of their careers to Beck being clowns again. Hawk was a total clown here. Yes. But in a way, it's... it's, They're happy because they're back together. It's nice to see Hawk happy again. Yes. His friend's going to be okay and nothing can go beat people up. Yes. Hawk explains there are various careers in this world, such as snow removal or garbage removal or wart removal. He and Animal are into head removal. They're in the head removal business. And they're starting with Warlord and Barbarian. And Animal says, I have learned to channel my pain into hate. 
and warlord, barbarian, I hate you. Yeah. I thought this was great. Oh, this next segment. Super Destroyer and Tony Super. <laughs> so Tony Super talked about him for at least a year. Big, powerful black guy. Never wins. I've been pushing Tony Super for a long time. Yeah, ne- he never he deserves ever wins. better. He deserves better. They they never they never do anything with him, but they always they, he's always kind of protected. He gets more offense than most jobbers. Just a week or two ago, he was out muscling the horseman. They had no idea what to do with him. So out comes the Super Destroyer. Super Destroyer comes out, and I start googling. I'm like, who was a Super Destroyer in Crockett in 1988? It wasn't Don Jardine. No. Like, who the hell was it? And, like, as I'm looking around, I eventually realize I was wasting my time. This is not any It was super just some destroyer. random geek. Every, if you looked at him, by the way, generic physique, generic gear, generic wrestling mask. I want generic height. In hindsight, he was actually pretty short. Yes. But this was every masked guy you ever saw in a pro wrestling show. But because he was facing Tony Suber, mm-hmm. you, the viewer, were under the assumption that he must be somebody. Yeah. Because, because he's Tony facing Suber. a jobber. Be- yeah. So they started doing a match. And it's going on for a while. And I was very confused as to what was going on. And they're going back and forth. And then Super Destroyer takes over. There was a long Cobra clutch spot. I'm trying to figure out, by this point, I was trying to figure out why Suber, who was a full head taller and at least 80 pounds heavier, was selling so much for this tiny little guy. And then Suber had a power slam out of nowhere and pinned him. That's right. This was the biggest win by a jobber on this show. I'm not counting the transformation of Big Bubba. Since the Mulkies. Since the Mulkies. And the place goes crazy. A jobber won. He's going crazy in the ring. The announcers are going crazy. And then they start screaming, Tony, Suber, we want to interview you. And there's a pause, and then someone says, ah, he went back to the dressing room. (laughs) I miss 80s wrestling. I thought, this was the biggest night of your life, and you fucking blew it right there. (laughs) Tony Suber, that's it for him. He should have taken his opportunity to get that interview. It occurs to me just now that... Uh, Tony Super's big win was similar in some ways to Keith Lee's debut, only m- more of a waste. Okay, but it definitely was more of a waste. <laughs> yes. Are you kidding me? But neither one was the way I would have done it. Paul Jones and the Powers of Pain come out for a promo. So Jones, he is upset that Animal Animal is back. You can tell that he it, was he was hoping he'd never return. He is denying this, of course. Yes. But you can tell it's a sad day in Jones' world. And he... You know, it doesn't matter to me the animal is back. I still have my men. They are still the strongest men in wrestling. When I think about the Road Warriors, I don't think about them coming back. I think about them laid out on the floor in the Carolinas. He says, well, I got my contract in my office the other day. And I opened the contract, and it was for a Bob Wire match. Bob Wire. The man who manages the ball bearing talks about the Bob Wire match. Yes. He says, I did not sign this contract. I signed an open contract, and the... Promoters put this barbed wire stipulation they in there. They were supposed to talk to me before signing me to any dangerous matches. He did not want his men's faces and bodies all scarred up. Meanwhile, the powers of painters mugging and flexing, uh, mugging and flexing. They don't and, give a shit. They don't care. Ric Flair, Tully Blanchard, and Arn Anderson versus Mike Jackson and Trent Knight and Rocky King. I was very distracted in that Powers of Pain promo, by the way, by those big gold shiny belts. Mm, they're still the six man champs. Yeah, that's what's missing in this business. Where the hell was Ivan? I don't know, actually. <laughs> it never showed up. Uh, so Mike Jackson's in there with a the horseman. Always awesome. Otherwise, it's, they're just toying with these other two fools. Mostly Trent Knight. They beat his ass. They beat Trent Knight up, and Flair submitted him clean with a figure four. Yes. Like, Nothing to write home about. Even against the biggest geeks in the world, Flair will always pull the tights or grab the ropes or something. He just beat Trent Knight clean. Yeah. <laughs> Why bother? So then they cut a promo. Dylan says, Ric Flair just showed you all how to properly apply a figure four leg lock. And when that hold is on, nobody can get out of it, not even Sting. He will bet any sum of money yes. that anybody Flair puts his hold on, including that loudmouth Sting, they cannot escape. So as J.J. is running his mouth, Flair disappears for a bit. And when Flair comes back, there's a woman with him. Yes. He pulled some random woman out of the crowd. Now... 
Short black old woman having the time of her life. She is, she is so, having the time of her life. So happy to be on TV with the Four Horsemen. And then Flair grabs her and he looks into the camera and he says, This is Dusty Rhodes. And whatever he said next got silenced. And we rewound it over and Trying over. Trying so hard to read his lips to see what. To figure out what he said. What horrible thing he said. Well, whatever it was, they bleeped him and they immediately went off the air. <laughs> I mean, they immediately went off the air. I don't know if the network bleeped him or if TBS bleeped him 30 years ago. Either is possible. This was like Bischoff when Rodman and Randy Savage got that mic together. Yes, yes. Only this was not live, so they no. could bleep him. Tully's laughing his ass off, and the segment goes off, goes off the air, and the show's done. Yes. I don't know what he said, but he was he was heavily insinuating she was Dusty's number one fan. Yeah. Yes. So I, I, it may have been a racial connotation, may have been a sexual. I, I don't know. Uh, man. And there will be gorilla shit all over the army. Wow. Let's start this NWA show. Okay. NWA World Championship Wrestling, March 12th, 1988. It opened with that same fantastic promo. Tag Team Wrestling is fantastic. Tick, tick, tick. I was hoping they would debut on the show, and that's why they let off with this. No, thing. they're debuting on the Flair Sting show. That's the big match. Mm. The Midnights versus the Fantastics for the titles. It's a big match. There's a lot of big matches yeah. in that show. They've done a shitty job building this up, by the way. The Fantastics? No, the whole the whole show. I mean, we know it's Flair Sting. Mm -hmm. What else do you know about it? The barbed wire match. Okay, what else? Uh, that's I think that's all that's been booked. There's only like, there's only like six matches in the show. It's not a so we've got two and it's two weeks away. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that sucks when you put it that way. Yes. I, it I know, seems like it's a long way off, but it's not. There it's is like a tag team away. title match. They have not announced it yet. There is a TV title match. They have not announced it yet. Uh, they haven't even announced the Midnight's and Fantastics. Like you said, yeah, they've only they've only announced those two. Maybe maybe there's only a five match. Show. I believe it's the Midnight's and the Fantastics. I believe it absolutely is. It I is. watched the show a hundred times, but okay. I believe it is the TV title match. Is Garvin and Rotunda? Garvin and Rotunda. Mm -hmm. uh, amateur rules. Amateur rules. What a fucking selling point that is. <laughs> so, yeah, there you go. We make fun of WWE, but, man, they at least promote their shows. There has been no no promotion for this outside the world. They need Adam Stephanie Mash. McMahon and some women on the show. Then we get some promotion. We do not need Stephanie McMahon on this show. Mm -hmm. I don't need Stephanie McMahon on any show I ever watch ever again. Mm -hmm. So they're in the studio, and Jim Crockett is there. <laughs> he announces, we've been working with our sponsors in the WTBS network. There will be... Limited commercial interruption in the show. There'll be no matches on The Clash interrupted by commercials, hopefully. 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 What does that mean? <laughs> it means hopefully. Actually, I presume they had to interrupt the Flair Sting match. You would have a hard time convincing 45 minutes. a ca major cable network to go 45 minutes and no commercials. Yeah. yeah. So, Shivani says, he, he finishes the line with Crockett, and he says, All right, let's go to David Crockett and Jim Ross. And I go to David Crockett and Jim Ross, who are standing eight feet away. Yes. <laughs> So, they explain Shane Douglas was scheduled to challenge Mike Rotunda for the TV title tonight, but he has not shown up to the building yet. Transportation issues, they've claimed. Mm -hmm. Lex Luger steps in, immediately removes his shirt. He got a bad Lex Luger promo. Mumbling a lot. Well, the thing was, it started out okay. He's talking about the Varsity Club. Says, when you guys tried to kill Barry, I guess they choked him with that... Coat hanger. Coat hanger, whatever. He says that wasn't pro wrestling, but we are going to take care of Sullivan, Steiner, and Rotundo our way with no rules. Isn't that what a coat hanger on the neck is? I, I don't know. Why is no rules okay if you're doing it, but if they're using a coat hanger with no rules, that's not allowed. But the point is, he made his point, and he should have just moved on or concluded is what he should Better, have done. Better, yes, yeah. But instead, he had to keep going. And then he just started rambling. Tully and Arn, the belts. I have no fucking idea what the point was because I zoned out. Mm -hmm. It sucked. Did you mention early on where you talked about the Varsity Club and, quote, the tactics that you revolved to? Yeah, they revolved to them. His tactics, yes. Yeah, he mumbled a lot, repeated some lines. It was not very good. You know, Luger never did these bad promos until after he did that one really great promo. I'm wondering if, like, that promo was so good that he thought, I must do promos like this all the time. I see. And he could never do it again. I thought you were just going to say, like, he had one 
he had uh, only so many good lines in his body, and he gave them all out in, in that one. Oh, that could have been what it was. Yeah. But the point was, it was after that that he started doing these long, rambling, boring fucking promos. It's been bad. Hey, you know what? You know how bad these promos are. How many times over the years that we watched this show in Nitro and say, you know what? Lex isn't in the Hall of Fame, but God, he was so over, and the people loved him, and he was a huge star. These interviews are single-handedly an argument against him ever going into the Hall of Fame. <laughs> it is amazing when you think about it, to go back and, and think about how over he was in the Horseman, how over he was when he left the Horseman, how over he was when he was fighting the Horseman, and how not over he is now. He is profoundly not over. It's, it's, it's gone, horrible. Gone down like a comet. We had Sting beating John Savage with the Scorpion in like 20 seconds. <laughs> Literally. They cut to the arena, they lower the lights, and there's a Scorpion. <laughs> that was it. a whole match. <laughs> Ric Flair and J.J. Dillon arrive for a promo. Flair runs down Sting. Says, when we wrestle, you're going to have to go into that locker room, look at all the other baby faces, look at Dusty Rhodes and Lex Luger and the Road Warriors and Hawk and Animal. You have to ask yourself, am I man enough to do what I said he could do? He said he was, he was due a big payday whenever he faced Sting, so he was very happy to plug a series of matches they had all over the country. And then he talked about sex for a while. And how good he was at it. Not good reviews of these matches, by the way, around the country at the time. Well, yeah. Sting was very green. Which led to Dave Meltzer's prediction mm. for the legendary Ric Flair Sting 45 minute draw. This is what he predicted a week prior to the match Ric Flair versus Sting. 20 plus minutes, lots of near falls. Sting won't sell the suplex. Rick somehow will get caught before he can jump off the top rope. In other words, this match will be exactly as expected. I'm not complaining. It still could be the best match of either card. He's speaking of WrestleMania 4. But do you know of anybody who is really excited about seeing this match? <laughs> Prediction. Flair will get destroyed. He won't lose the title. The finish will be something we've all seen dozens of times. Woo. Wow. That was a swing and a miss right there. Well, in some ways. Yeah. It was a finish we've seen dozens of times. Yeah, but it was a legendary match. Well, it, we'll talk about here 30 years later. We'll talk about it here shortly. Uh, Road Warriors beat Gary Phelps and Keith Steinborn. Animal clothesline one of the geeks head off and pinned him. Two matches in the show, not even 60 seconds of actual wrestling. Did like that this Gary Phelps, Hawk is going to press slam him. And Gary Phelps did not help him at all. Oh, no. He didn't push down on the guy's shoulders. Nope. There was no assistance. Hawk did get him up, but like... Animal saw this, and he got in the ring, and he just took this guy's head off with a lariat. That was the end. They had seen enough. It is amazing. I don't know if you ever watched the Road Warriors DVD, but uh, Hawk was fucked up for a lot of these matches. You don't say. It's amazing no one ever died. And promos. Speaking of which, they do a promo. Animal's out there trying to growl through his hockey mask. I maybe understood half of what he said. So they go to Hawk. Hawk runs down the Bumbarian and the Waffle Lord. You know what I got out of this promo? <laughs> That's what I got. The Road Warriors were an unstoppable force who never lost. Right? Correct. Okay. They could get away with this. Yes. Hawk could get away with being a complete, just, just, he was so geeky. He was a clown. His but promos... Or the promos of a clown. But it didn't matter, mm -hmm. because they never lost. They looked like Hawk and Animal. And they killed everybody. And they won in, in two minutes every single week. If you're a mid-card dude, you can't do this shit, or no. you're a clown. But when you're unbeatable, you can do pretty much whatever you want. It's another great example that wins and losses matter. Yeah. They could not have done this as a, as a two losers. They'd have been the jive tones. <laughs> They left, and Paul Ellering remained. He said Paul Jones's dreams were about to turn into a nightmare, promised gruesome, ugly things would happen on March 27th. Mm. The Jive Tones versus Rocky King and Gene Ligon. We had less than 60 seconds of action between two matches. And, and this then damn thing. <laughs> they drag out the Jive Tones for fucking 10 goddamn boring minutes. When Tiger Conway put a jobber in a front face lock and laid on the mat, I was like, I have gone to hell. Where? <laughs> where fucking terrible. Where to begin with this fucking thing? First of all, we had Rocky King and Gene Ligon getting the heat on the jive tones. 
doing double teams and tagging in and out and stuff. Fucking Rocky King making a one-man comeback and destroying both tones by himself. There was a point here. I should have written down specifically what the move was, but it was like a go-behind or a sit-out, a very basic amateur escape Tiger Conway did. It took him like an hour. <laughs> you just watch. It was like watching frame by frame as this guy went through this amateur move. Announcers are talking about the Crockett Cup every year now. I think we've been around for all three of these, and every year they push. It's an offensive tournament. That's right. And every year I ask... As opposed to what? You know, a defensive tournament. <laughs> what, what would that be? You can just go to a draw and like... Both teams advance? Yeah, what sure. What the fuck is an offensive tournament? I don't know. So here's a spot they actually did in this match. I think you had toned out by now. This did go like 10 minutes. The Jive Tones have Ligon in the ring. And they whip him into the ropes. And they join hands. And they're going to give him a double clothesline. But Gene Ligon ducks. And he keeps running. And he hits the ropes. And they just... Give him a double clothesline anyway. That sounds awesome. That was their spot. They hit the double leg sweep, and they won. Love how when you do a side Russian leg sweep, like you stand next to the guy, and you kind of leg lace him, mm -hmm. and you put your arm on his shoulder because mm -hmm. you're going to pull him backwards. So Tiger Conway doesn't even put his arm around the guy's shoulder. He just stands next to him and, like, lurches backwards, and they both fall down. Just gravity pulls the man down? I was so happy when they didn't do a promo, but little did I know. <laughs> apparently, you know. they had to just go. I don't even know what. Somebody took their gear away, I think. They had to go backstage uh, and get a top hat on. and bow ties and put them back on. Sure. Dusty Rhodes promo. First, he pushes the Crockett Cup and the $1 million prize. Then he pushes the barbed wire match for a while. And then it is time to discuss the envelope. This fucking envelope. Is this me or does his story change every week? Well, this week, the envelope is in the hands of his attorneys. It isn't, yes. He explains that there are evil things in this envelope. He says this, and a fan shouts out, How evil! He says, I will not deny that there is a picture of me in this envelope, but I must get to the bottom of what else is in that photograph. Mm -hmm. Because he says, obviously, I don't do that sort of thing. And then he flashes the biggest grin. <laughs> so keep that in mind. Not only <laughs> is he not worried about the envelope, now he's bragging that he, in fact, did everything in the envelope, and he's proud of it. I guess. That's what I got out of this. What I got out of this is he is unfaithful to his wife, there is photographic evidence of this, and he's so proud. Well, it's funny you should mention that, because he mentioned that envelope or no envelope, to win the U.S. title, Larry Zbysko would have to beat his ass. And if Larry Zbysko couldn't beat his ass, then Baby Doll should leave Larry and cross the ring and join a real man. Wow. He's recruiting talent right here. Yes, he is. He's the good guy. He's the booker. <laughs> this is his idea. I've never, I don't think in the history of professional wrestling, I have ever seen a storyline that a booker wrote for himself and then proceeded to undermine in such a manner. Right? I don't know. It, it's, it's really terrible. I've seen bookers write stuff for guys that guys don't like, and then they try to undermine it. Mm -hmm. But, like, this is his story. Yes. To think this was the year. <laughs> Midnight Express versus Curtis Thompson and Trent Knight. So, I don't know what happened here, but the audio for the Midnight's entrance was reduced to, you know, usually they're very good about keeping the ambient studio noise around, the announcers and the crowd and whatever. This time, they turn all of that down. You hear their generic theme, and about four guys just going... <laughs> for minutes! <laughs> for a long time. I assumed it had to be Cornette, but then he's out there. Cornette is out there. He, if you're a Jim Cornette fan as a performer, this is the Jim Cornette for you. He's talked the entire match. I don't think the announcers even asked him a question. He literally should have been put in the Guinness Book of World Records for this segment because he talked from bell to bell. Uh -huh. Afterwards, they did a promo. Yes. He talked for like another four minutes straight. He seriously talked for like 10 straight minutes without taking a breath right here. Yeah. He was like Houdini. It was amazing. He could have been underwater for 10 minutes here without getting any air. Yeah. 
Uh, About what? I have no idea. He just he, he ran on down, and on and he on. He ran down all the babyface teams except the Fantastics. He did not mention them. He When they threw one of the geeks outside and Stan clubbered the guy, Cornette says Stan was beating some meat. He said he was beating his meat all over the floor. And then he cracked himself up. He did. <laughs> I actually... This was also a scandal back in the day. That Cornette got away with talking about beating his meat on national television. Mm-hmm. I mean, I could be wrong. I mean, I suppose we could ask him, but I'm pretty sure that that was a mistake. Like, he was just ranting. It may have been. And he realized that he said beating his meat, and he started laughing. That's entirely possible. Because Cornette never cracks himself up, you know what I mean? And he's always prepared. Yes. He says a million jokes, and there are obviously he, you know, he has the setup and the delivery, and he knows what he's doing. Yeah, the, you're I probably right. I think that was an accident. I hadn't thought about it, but you're probably right. Yeah, his own reaction to it made me think that he accidentally said it and probably got a look from both announcers mm-hmm. and probably just lost it. Yes. And then recovered, because he's Jim Cornette. Yes. Uh, he had some lines about Mexicans in here somewhere, how many of them can fit into one car. Uh, Bobby Eaton pinned Knight with a grave digger, and then, as you noted, Cornette just kept on talking. Yeah. I've never seen someone talk for so long without breathing. It's I'm, I'm including Dave. If you ever listen <laughs> to the Observer Radio yeah. Show. This was incredible. Says the only other teams worth a flip in the tournament are the Powers of Pain and the Horsemen. Once again, teasing encounters with uh, the heel teams because they've run through all the baby faces. So he's just going off, and he's ranting, and he's raving, and he's moving from point to point. He's sweating up a storm, and behind him, Bobby and Stan are just leaning against the ropes, laughing their asses off at this lunatic. And finally, he just was done, and they left. And as I wrote here, Jim Cornette was a vocal fucking juggernaut. (laughs) <laughs> That's a good way to put it. That's yes. exactly what it was. From that extreme, we go to Ricky, Stan- Ricky Santana and Bob Riddle. Oh, God. As noted, I am done recapping these. They did four minutes of arm bars, and Ricky hit a top rope splash and one. And people applauded. Yeah. They accepted this. Where's the WWE audience today <laughs> to just turn on this guy and boom out of the building? <laughs> that actually would be awesome. The Jive Tones, as threatened, returned. I was so distracted during this promo because behind them, <laughs> Dale Laparouse. Well, we would later find out it was Dale Laparouse. All we could see, we could see only see from the neck down. So there's just a super skinny, gangly, super pale guy in tights that are too big. He looked like the real Laparca, like a skeleton in, <laughs> in wrestling gear. Drugs. He's so like, fucking. Like they're, they're called tights. Oh, yeah. They're not supposed to sag. These were looses. <laughs> So that's what we're focusing on visually. Meanwhile, the Jive Tones are out there plugging the Senior Cup. Oh, God. Eventually, they created it to Crockett, you know, uh, Jim Crockett Senior Memorial Cup. And Shaska's running his mouth and it's going fine. He promises they're going to make a million dollars look good. So then we go to Shaska goes Tiger. first, right? They knew they were cutting a promo. They knew Shaska would talk and run his mouth for a minute. And it would be Tiger's turn to talk. Right, He had a chance to prepare for this. He had time. He knew what was going to be fed to him and how he should respond. So he says, when we win that, win that million dollars, we're going to have a party, and we're going to invite... What's her name? And they go, Whitney Houston. Whitney, Whitney Houston. Houston! Somebody else who was Janet Jackson or whatever, who was popular in the 80s. And then they start asking about other teams in the tournament. He forgets their names, too. Oh, it gets better. We're going to face... Hawk, Animal, Dusty Rhodes. He forgets these names. And then, do you know what the point of his promo was? Oh, I do. There's a million dollars on the line in the Crockett Cup. You understand? The winning team is going to get a million dollars. One million dollars American cash. Yep. Does Tiger Conway say, do you know what we do for one million dollars? <laughs> he does not. No. Yeah. This fucking idiot says, the Road Warriors, the Powers of Pain... Do you know what these men would do for $1 million? It's actually even better. He says, these men will kill someone. That's right. These men will kill someone for a million million dollars. dollars. He says this, and Shaska blinks twice like, oh my God, they will kill someone for a million dollars. David Crockett, who I love David Crockett, but he really is terrible at his job. When Tiger Conway says this, David Crockett, he's just, he starts staring at him, and he's smiling. And he's trying so hard not to say anything, to the point where Conway finally moves on to another topic, but David cannot help himself, and he says, 
Maybe you guys. <laughs> this was Tiger is an all time terrible promo. Do you understand? And a very bad wrestler as well. An all time awful promo. I actually wrote this is a one of a kind terrible promo. Yes. I- this was one of the worst promos I've ever seen. It's I demand, not the only one he's done like this. No, this is the worst he's done, but not the only one like this. March 12th, 1988, NWA World Championship Wrestling. All of you go watch this promo immediately. It's like in the middle of the show. It should be very easy to find. It's unbelievably awful. And then we go... Well, actually, before we move on, I haven't done this in a while. Usually when I give this award, it's someone who gets beat up. We never see them again. This is the highest profile, worst wrestler of all time of the week that we've ever had. Tiger Conway Jr. Yes. The worst wrestler of all time of the week. Now, as soon as I typed those words, I realized Lex Luger was wrestling Dale Laparus. Well, first we went to the fountain of charisma known as Jim Crockett (laughs) Jr. And he explains to us, Shane Douglas is not here. We have promised a title match. We are going to give the fans that title match today. So, Jimmy Garvin will challenge for the world TV title later on in the hour. He, This was a million times better <laughs> than what, your performance. Tiger Conway. No, oh, he was a million times better than Tiger Conway Jr. I agree with that, too. But yes. He and he was, was a mannequin. He was still so flat I didn't even bother writing it down. He was Tory on Raw last week. That's a good comparison. Who was better than Tiger Conway Jr. Yeah, absolutely. In a different way. So, yes, it's Lex Luger versus Dale Leperus, who has his name spelled a new weird way this week. Yeah. We need to go back and chronicle these and see if they ever spelled it the same way twice. L-A-P-E-Y-R-O-U-S-E. <laughs> Dude. Lapey Rouse. It's like a gimmick. It is. So he's in there with Lex Luger. He's horrible. They look like... They do not look like the same species. <laughs> well, no. <laughs> he's they're... so awful in this match, okay? <laughs> Luger gave up on doing anything physical. He did a power slam where he didn't even follow through and go to his no, knees. He, he, yeah, he threw the guy up and, and down and just stayed on his feet. He came off the ropes and spun him and just let go of him. Yes. And Laparus crashes on the ground. Yeah. So Lex goes for an arm bar. Just grab the arm, push the guy down. Fucking Dale Laparus is fighting back. Yeah. Like it's UF goddamn C. <laughs> He's like his arm is in legit danger. So this went like two minutes. The announcer is making jokes about how skinny Dale is, and Ross says he needs to go back to New Orleans and eat some more gumbo. Finally, Luger racks him, and Tony Schiavone says, matter of fact, didn't take much effort at all to get this man up. Mm-hmm. So yeah, Dale Laparus was awful. But do you know who was worse? Tiger Conway Jr. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know, dude. Oh, I do. After watching that match, I kind of was feeling a little bad for all the things I'd said about Tiger Conway. <laughs> nope. Dale Laparus is fucking atrocious. I'm not changing my mind. You're right about Laparus. Conway was worse. I mean, someday you know we're going to get the jive tones against Dale Laparus, and then you'll really find out. Oh, God. <laughs> you'll find something out. I, I fully expect a, a literal black hole to open in the ring. We're, yeah. we're, we'll make a major scientific discovery on that day. So Garvin comes out for a promo. He's getting his TV title shot. <laughs> against... Sean Douglas isn't here, he says. Sean Douglas is not here, or Shane. Yes. So he's ranting. This is so awesome. I'm going to get a shot for the TV title. I'm going to get a shot for the world TV title. I'm going to get a shot for the prestigious world TV title. And he's going off about this belt, and he wants it around his waist. And he stops, and he says, Precious, have I told you I love you today? And they smack in the lips, and he leaves. Brought a tear to my eye. Just the best couple ever. Powers of Pain versus Randy Hogan and Rick Rossi. A long beating that went through a break. I love Tony describing the Warlord and Barbarian as, quote, those big lugs. Well, they are. I mean... I've never actually heard that from a human. I've only heard it in cartoons. Warlord is a big lug. Yeah. Barbarian's pretty... For, for a guy that size can move. But a Warlord is a big lug. My favorite spot in this match was when... Warlord drops down to one knee, and Barbarian picks up Orasi and does like a backbreaker across, backbreaker across Warlord's knee, and then picks him up and drops him across his own knee, just because mm-hmm. he's biggest strong he can do it. This went uh, by squash match standards pretty long, seven or eight minutes, not counting the commercials. It was fine, never got boring. Warlord has improved radically, and eventually they hit. <laughs> this amused me. They hit a rockerplex and then a heart attack for the win. 
Just stealing all the moves of the tag teams on the other channel. So, according to this dictionary here, several definitions of lug, including to carry or drag a heavy or bulky object, you lug it up the stairs. Sure. But yes, an uncouth, aggressive man. Well... That's Warlord and Barbarian right there. certainly were uncouth and aggressive. Yeah, and you'll be shocked to know that usage of the term peaked in the 1940s, according mm. to this thing right here. Actually, I would have guessed earlier. But it's really leveled I would have out. like the uh, vaudeville era. Nah, nah. The vaudeville era it was it was much lower, actually. Mm. It, it hit a peak in 19, I'd say, 45 or so, and then kind of fell from there. I'm sure you're surprised. But then there was an uptick in the 70s, and it's leveled off. Maybe there just, were just more lugs in the 40s. Could have been. Yeah. So they cut a promo after the break. <laughs> it wasn't a terrible promo, especially by Paul Jones standards, but he went for a long time. They're going to eliminate the Road Warriors in 1988. My men are superior, blah, blah, blah. He's going on and on and on. And the whole time, Warlord and Barbarian are standing in front of him just holding up their belts. And if you just watch Barbarian, that belt starts to get heavy. Yeah. And they're under these hot lights. And Paul Jones won't fucking shut up. And his arm and starts, he's tired. And he's tired. He had to wrestle a long match just before this. Yes. And his arm starts to get lower and lower. And there's a point where Jones stops to take a breath, and it, you feel like it might wrap up, but he keeps going, and Barbarian just hangs his head, <laughs> lifts the belt back up. And then Paul's talking and talking and talking about nothing all that exciting, and then suddenly in the middle of his set, it, he just stops. He says something like, we'll be the Road Warriors. And then he walks away. And that's the end. Yeah. <laughs> It is that hard. It, it is for him. That's what makes him so much fun, though. It is. Mike Rotunda versus Gorgeous Jimmy. Finally, something on this show that this was, is newsworthy. This is the most newsworthy thing that happened on this show in a long time. They had a very fun... I don't know how long this went. It went through two commercial breaks, close to 20 minutes. TV title match. They did lots of wrestling. Rotunda would just do little occasional hair pulls and tight pulling, but basically they grappled back and forth. And Rotunda couldn't get that the uh, advantage that way. And so even though it's his gimmick to be the amateur wrestler, he was being out-wrestled. So he started throwing punches and elbows and stomps. A ruffian. Because he's a heel. A roughneck. Yeah. Now that being said, when Garvin would make a mini comeback during this match, Rotunda would shoot a double leg to cut him off. Because he is a good wrestler. Hey, that's leading to their it's amateur just, rules match. It is. It's just that Garvin's better. That's why Rotunda's the heel. Back in the day... One of the ways to be a heel is be a worse wrestler than your opponent. So, <laughs> he's got the heat on him. And Garvin's down on all fours. And Rotunda just does a kick to the ribs. And he celebrates, yeah, look at me, Kevin. And Kevin goes, field goal! They're all very happy about this kick to the ribs. And then like five more minutes go by. And Rotunda goes to the corner. He's going to do the kick to the ribs again. And Garvin is uh, Lucy. He pulls himself out of the way. Rotunda is Charlie Brown. He kicks and goes flying, lands flat in his back. Garvin makes his big comeback. He hits a running elbow. Not even like a jumping elbow. He just runs at him and elbows him. And he makes a cover. And the ref counts three, but then Sullivan puts the foot on the ropes. Yeah. So cheating and not even being good at cheating. Because the three count happened. But then the ref sees the foot on the ropes. He thinks, I must have made a mistake. And the match continues. So Garvin makes another cover. Sullivan tries to hit the ring. Precious tackles Sullivan. Yes, Precious goes after Sullivan. Yes. So she stopped him. She did, st well. Somehow. <laughs> she grabbed his foot and then the ref went over because there's like a man and a woman fighting outside. Yes. And, and somehow they all fall to the ground. And of all the people, the ref is killed. <laughs> that is what happened. Actually, I'm glad you got that. I, I merely wrote ref got bumped because I was yeah. not clear on how it went down. Nah, he was brawling, or he was trying to break up a brawl between Precious and Kevin Sullivan yes. in an S&M mask. Yes. <laughs> he falls out of the ring, lands on the cement, he dies. <laughs> so then Steiner gives Garvin the coat hanger. Yes. Or not Garvin. Uh, Rotunda. Rotunda. And he chokes Garvin unconscious. The referee... The old, wrap the coat hanger on the neck and then wrap your arm around it. Yeah, the referee wakes up. He only sees his big, thick arm. He yeah. doesn't see the coat hanger, yeah. so... He rules that Garvin is unconscious. He calls for the bell. This was interesting because I I don't know what happened here. I don't know if Shane Douglas really was late. But normally when you advertise a match, mm -hmm. especially back in the day, and the guy can't be there and you put a replacement in, you the replacement wins. More often than not. Yeah. So not only was Jimmy Garvin a replacement who did not win, 
but he lost via dusty finish. Double whammy. <laughs> That's what happened. This company did not need this at this point in time. No. But hey, on this match, or on the on this show, if you can do one good long match on a show that otherwise is nothing but squash matches, great. That's all we need. So this is, as we noted, the most newsworthy thing to happen on the show in a long time. And everyone was going crazy. It was a good match. And then chaos at the end. Everyone's going crazy for the finish. We, did, we even talk about how as the choking is going on, Santana comes out to try to hit, make the save, and he gets fought off. Gets waffled with a chair shot. <laughs> gets off just, just destroyed smashed. it with a chair. I think somebody else was out there, too, and got fought off, and eventually the, the uh, heels left. But So the place is still buzzing. This place needs a chance to calm down. There's a chance to catch its breath. The, the whole crowd does. So Dylan's out there to cut this promo. And he also needed a chance to catch his breath, it sounded like. He was uh, not too excited. But he plugs all the matches into the Clash, promises all the championships are going to be in the line. And talks about Sting and Flair. He just says, we're going to find out if the Scorpion has a better hold than the figure four. And he's done. He's going to go leave. And whoever the announcer is, it's probably Crockett, but I don't remember. But he says, there's no counter to that Scorpion, you know. And Dylan stops and looks at him and says, there's no counter that you know of. That you know of. That you know of. And he leaves. Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson versus Steve Atkinson and Dave Spearman. Hey, you know who's a good team? Uh, Tully and Arn. Yeah, you know why they were great? Well, a lot of reasons. A lot of reasons. Great promos. Mm-hmm. They were great technical wrestlers. Yeah. But they were also great brawlers, and they were great heel bullies. There was nothing All they the could above. not do. Yes, yeah. And they beat the shit out of these guys. Tully did the... It wasn't exactly like it, but it was very similar to Pentagon's arm breaker spot mm-hmm. back here in 1988. Just did, these guys. Listen, Ricky Santana comes out and does the same arm bar for four minutes and just lies there doing nothing. It's hideously dull. Yeah. The horsemen came out here. All they did was work the arm for four minutes, but they were always doing different ways. They did arm bars. They did hammer locks. They did standing hammer locks. They did grounded hammer locks. They were at, you know, sincerely trying to crank this hold on and go for the submission win. They ran the, ran the arm into the post. They did drop knees in the arm. They were doing stuff the entire time. Nothing complicated. Nothing. There were no moonsaults. There were no flips. Just working the arm, but they were so good at it. So the other gimmick to this match is J.J. Dillon was mic'd. So every once in a while, we'd, you'd hear him giving advice to his men or a pep talk or encouraging the referee to stop this match. This man clearly cannot take any more. It was fine, but it would have been a lot more effective if Jim Cornette hadn't talked for 20 minutes straight earlier. So eventually, <laughs> the best part of this was they're destroying Spearman's arm, trying to get the ref to stop it, and they won't. And finally, they let Spearman go. Atkinson tags in. Arn grabs his head and DDTs him. Should have pinned him right there. I guess they had more time to fill. So they beat him up for a while, too, and eventually Tully pinned him with a slingshot suplex. After the break, they cut a promo. What a great promo. The promo's even better than the match, man. Tully's explaining. This is a great thing about the horsemen. They're heels, but they make such great points about the sporting aspect of wrestling. Absolutely. They note that all these other idiot teams come out here, the Road Warriors, whoever, they just smash guys in like 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. We could beat these guys in 30 seconds, but we don't. We go out there and we practice. Yeah. We master our craft. We hone our skills over that eight minutes of smashing these horrible jobbers right here. He, he talks about how baseball teams go through spring training and football teams go through training camp. What you just saw was our spring training. Yeah. That was our practice. So... He talks about how they do this, other teams don't, and that's why they're the best. And then Arn talks about wrestling. Arn's promo is just... The point of his promo is we wear trunks, plain trunks, and plain boots. Mm-hmm. And we're wrestlers. This is not showbiz. We, yeah. are, we are not stars, he says. They're the fucking horsemen! <laughs> they're standing there behind Ric Flair all the time. Yeah. This is preposterous. Well, Flair does... I don't know if you call it plain wrestling. What in the fuck are you talking about? Uh, he, He's got a $30,000 robe and his watches and his fucking sunglasses and his goofy hats and his shoes. And Arn's here about, oh, we're all about just traditional technical wrestling. Well, even then, Ric Flair was a guy who had very, very expensive but nice clothing. And he's talk- he's comparing himself to the other channel, which has Million Dollar Men and Macho Men and Hulkamaniacs and what the hell is a WrestleMania 4? 
Well, it's this, it was a Savage. Savage. Final, the, 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 the Hogan and Andre. There's no goofball running around with a two by four going, ho. Oh. They're just plain wrestlers in plain gear. But he's sure, clear, he's clear to say, or he says clearly, this is not showbiz. We are not stars. But the fans keep coming back and they pay their money to watch us beat people up because we're very good at it. And a year later, he's in WWF. Well, funny how that works. But I like, there was a line earlier when Lex was out here. One of the things he said about the horsemen was how they were rude to fans who wanted autographs. How dare you belittle these fans who pay your salary? And Arn says, Luger, the fans don't pay our salary. This man, points to Crockett, and his brother pay our salary, and they pay us a lot. That was awesome. So they could break or take out Luger's giant arms as easily as they did this goof in the ring and promise they would win the Crockett Cup. I don't think they'll do it quite that easily. Well, probably not. But a skinny arm. It's good to have confidence. Yeah. Rick Steiner versus Gary Royal. Fuck, Rick Steiner... <laughs> Speaking of guys who it's amazing never killed anyone. This is another one of those weird things. So we're watching 1999 Nitro from 19 years yes, ago this yeah. week. Scott Steiner's got a back injury. He's been off TV for like three months now. And so they've replaced him with his own brother, Rick, who's going out there and just fucking people up right and left, just bullying people. I mean, he'll do spots and he'll cooperate, but he also kicks the shit out of them. Mm -hmm. Here we are. Like a decade prior to that, Rick Steiner's out there as part of the Varsity Club with Gary Royal. He's just fucking mauling this guy. Just tearing him apart. He gave him a move I have never seen before. I hope I'll never see it again. He grabs him, and he's going to do a simple headlock takeover. But he does not take the guy over. He takes him halfway over and drops him right on his fucking head. Just killed him. The guy just on his destroyed back. destroyed him. And Rick's response... Is to look up and just look into the camera and smile. Yeah. <laughs> look what I did to this I've guy. I've ended a life. You're a national I television. I damn near killed him. He yanks at his tongue. Yeah. He puts him in the sugar hold and pulls his tongue for this submission. <laughs> yes, You're right. not allowed to pull a guy's tongue. This referee sucks. You're glossing over the part where he suplexed him onto his head before putting him in the sugar hold and yanking his tongue out. Yes. I mean, it was enjoyable. Oh, it ways, sure was. Oh, oh, my, my God, God, it was. Oh, the varsity club of the best. I like Gary Royal. Why do you have to beat him up so bad? Couldn't he have beat up Dale Laparus instead? That would be better. That would be better. So they go to cut a promo, and <laughs> Crockett doesn't even have a question. He just says, you're repulsive, you and your guys, and he holds the mic out. <laughs> well, he's not wrong. So Sullivan cuts his promo. In, in 2018, we would say he was subtweeting the Horsemen and the Minute Express and the Road Warriors. He makes veiled references to all the other teams in the roster. Says his men would beat them all. Talks about Jimmy Garvin. Claims to have paid for a lot of good times Jimmy Garvin had in Singapore. Yeah. What? Well, he spends a lot of time in Singapore. And He's, Garvin does as well, apparently? Well, he was he was trying to get him into the varsity club, if I recall correctly. I was, I, Some sort of weird thing. I suppose. My favorite part is he goes, This man, Mike Rotundo, is the greatest world television champion of all time. And Rick Steiner suddenly screams, I'm the number one contender. And Sullivan says, Shut up, Rick. And Rick is upset, and he starts yelling at Rotundo. Mm -hmm. Rotundo starts yelling at Rick. They fucking start screaming at each other, and it looks like they're about to break up. They're shoving each other? I am expecting Kel Kevin Sullivan to turn around and just whip both their asses or scream at him or something. Instead, Rotundo and Steiner are screaming at each other. Sullivan turns around and just looks at him. And they scream at each other for a while, and then they stop. He turns around and keeps going. <laughs> Just let him get it out Just of their system. Let him go. <laughs> oh, this group I don't rules. know why I thought that was so awesome. <laughs> so then Sullivan's talking. He, of course, costs out Dusty Rhodes. And then apparently he got the call sign right away. He says, the American dream is dead. Everyone at home hates their wife and they can't afford the car. That was the end. That's not quite a quote, but that is what he said. Basically, yeah. yeah. I loved, I loved, I loved that promo. <laughs> it was amazing. Like, every week I, I talk about how weird the Varsity Club is. Mm -hmm. Oh, it is. And how, <laughs> I mean, everybody remembers Undoubtedly it. weird. I mean, the more I watch, the more obvious it is why everybody remembers it. Because it was so great. It's an incredible act. It is incredible. And, like, Rotundo and Steiner, in the ring, they're, they're, they're portrayed as very dangerous. Yeah. Especially Steiner. But, man, when it's interview time, they're fucking dorks. You can laugh at these guys. You can fear them. You can respect them because they are good wrestlers. They, you know what it comes across? I mean, I'm sure this is the angle, but Sullivan, the devil worshiper, 
I mean, whether he actually worships the devil or not, we don't know. But what is clear is that he is a highly intelligent man. Yes. He is well aware that these two meatheads, <laughs> they clearly got scholarships based on their athletic ability and nothing else. Yes. And he knows they're idiots. <laughs> he knows I can completely manipulate these two yeah, numbskulls. Yeah, they're vulnerable. And there will be gorilla shit all over the army. Lance is tired. It's an hour or two hours later where he's at. So let's get moving, Lance. Let's get through this show the best we can. All right, NWA World Championship Wrestling, April 18th, 1988. And we joined the Fantastics versus the Midnight Express uh, in progress. Uh, and Ross, Jim Ross and Bob Cottle uh, are calling the action. We only see a couple minutes of heat and we get the show open, so it's just a teaser that we are going to see this match later on tonight. We get the show open with Tony and JR and David Crockett saying we are going to see this match further on. Then they run down the Crockett Cup and the Clash of Champions. They got two big shows to plug on this, uh, this night. And we open with the Varsity Club versus Ryan Wagner and Keith Steinborn. So, as I'm sure you're aware, on the way to StarCast on the airplane, I sat next to Kevin Sullivan. We were, uh, is that your cat? I do have a cat. I didn't no. hear it, but perhaps. Yeah, it, yeah. I've got anyway. two cats and two dogs, so we could have a zoo going here. It sounds like the filthy show. So anyway, we were at the airport, and I had a shirt that I got at the Las Vegas Fight Shop down for the convention weekend, and I was it's a Hart Family Dungeon shirt. And as I'm as we're getting ready to board, there's a kind of short fella there, and he's looking a little older. And as I start walking past him, he's looking at my shirt. And so I looked over and I noticed, oh my God, it's, it's fucking Kevin Sullivan right here. And he's about to ask me about my shirt. And I was like, Kevin Sullivan. And we talked for a little bit there. And then we happened to both be in an exit row. And he was on the other side sitting next to his daughter. And he switched places with her. We sat together the whole flight. We talked the entire time. It was, it was just the most fun flight. But of course, I asked him about the varsity club. And I said, this thing was just so bizarre you got these two college athletes these clean-cut college athletes and you're a devil worshiper and like somehow it's awesome and he explained to me that and i didn't know this because i was like 10 he goes in the 80s there were all of these scandals involving the fraternities and you know the frat guys on drugs and alcohol and these parties. I guess Roadhouse or whatever had come out in the late 70s, and it was kind of like it, it spurred all of this into happening in the 80s, and the 80s were the decade of excess anyway. And so the, his idea for the Varsity Club was these were two clean-cut college guys that ended up in a fraternity, and he was essentially like their dealer. He was the one that was getting them all fucked up all the time. He had them under his thumb. And, like, as soon as he explained it to me, it was like, this fucking makes perfect sense. Like, I'm sure in the 80s it was, like, obvious to everybody, but watching in 2018 as a 42-year-old man, I'm like, what the fuck's going on here? But that's the Varsity Club. Well, I was in, I guess I was finishing high school, uh, getting ready to go to university when I was watching this, and I didn't get that. I always thought it was weird that this evil wizard was managing these two Varsity guys, but... For some reason, I liked the Varsity Club, and I think it was just I was a, I was a big fan of Rick Steiner because he just looked like a dude that would kill you. Well, he was. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's exactly that's, that's, what he was. Yeah, that's what he did here. Um, these matches are pretty much nothing. They just beat the hell out of these guys. They did have an interesting double-team move where Rick picked the dude up like a heart attack, and then Mike Rotunda did a drop kick to his back into a hot shot on the rope that looked devastating. And they just beat these guys up. At one point, Steiner's like ripping the guy's mouth and tongue out of his face a little bit. And JR comments, it's like, we don't recommend you try this at home, kids. And it's like, what? You never know, you might try and goozle your friend. Yeah. And uh, it ended up, Steiner ended up giving Steinborn a German and just folded this poor dude in half, just dumped him high on his shoulders and head. And then kind of just sugared his head in a bit of a submission and got the guy to tap while he was doing the with the guy's lips as he got him to tap. It was great. I remember when I was young, there was a there was some squash match on a WWE or WWF like primetime wrestling or something, 
and the heel or whoever had done this move, and Gorilla Monsoon called it the Sugar Hold. And I hadn't recorded it like I recorded a lot of things. And so I didn't know what a sugar hold was. I thought I knew all the moves in wrestling. And here's Gorilla Monsoon talking about a sugar hold. So for years, I was trying to figure out what this sugar hold was. And it was probably decades before I finally figured out this is the famed sugar hold right here. Yeah, I've heard a lot of guys just use it as a bit of a generic term, too, for any kind of... Anything you stretch a guy with, yeah. Yeah. And and then we got the great, uh, and and I'm being sarcastic here, the Varsity Club promo, where <laughs> Rick and uh, Mike are basically bickering like six year olds. Well, well, Kevin Sullivan cuts a promo. It was bizarre. It was not only bizarre, but it was they're screaming at each other again. They started this last week, and Rotundo starts laughing uproariously, and he screams Robbie, because that's Rick's real name. So then Rick goes, okay, Lawrence, I'll say your name, too. And that's when Sullivan calms them both down. I died. I didn't know his real name was Lawrence. I thought he was actually Michael Rotundo, but his real name is Lawrence Michael Rotundo. I didn't know that, so I didn't even catch that on the promo. Yeah, it was awesome. It's not the, not the only time real names are used on this show. Either. No, not at all. All right, then we go to the Midnight Express Fantastics match. Uh, I thought it was a title match, but it's actually non-title. And it's joined in progress. They got heat on Tommy Rogers. They announced that they're like 25 minutes in. So this was a long-ass match. And, you know, the crowd's going crazy. Get a hot tag to Fulton. The place is going crazy. Uh, He just gets a brief flurry on the hot tag, and they cut him off, too. And this is just going insane. We get a bunch more, you know, another... Five ten minutes of heat. I think they announced that there's forty five minutes gone at one point, and then uh, where are we? Missing my notes here. I'm getting ahead of myself. Thirty five minute call. Oh, the great spot. <laughs> the Midnight Express. One guy grabs. Uh, I guess it's Fulton's hands, and the other guy grabs his feet, and they start swinging the guy like you do if you're going to throw somebody into a lake. Yes. And they're not really doing it very well, and they're swinging him a bit, and they finally let him go. And this guy flies like one foot, and the now Coddle's trying to put it over, saying they threw him halfway across the ring. It's like that was the worst spot ever. The great rocket launcher spot there at the end. Basically, the heels try it. The baby faces pulled Fulton out of the way. Rogers goes up top. They hit their own rocket launcher. One, two, three. The place goes batshit crazy for this finish. I thought it was a title match, too. Yeah, literally jumping up and down. It's the Jim Cornette line of throwing babies in the air. They were going crazy. They're going crazy, and I thought, my God, they changed the tag titles here on the show. And turns out it's a non-title match, but the point of this is the fans were so invested in wins and losses that as important as the titles were, if you merely won... It didn't even matter that they weren't getting the titles. They won. They beat the Midnight Express. The fans, absolutely, they just loved it. I can't even, I can't even describe how over this was. Yeah, it was a bigger pop than when the Money in the Bank gets cashed in today. Like they were just going crazy. And the thing that I loved about it, it's like this was kind of like when Cody won last night. If you were there at All In, apparently it didn't translate on television, but. Literally, as Dave noted last night, it was like somebody won the actual NWA title in the 80s. That's how that's how big the pop was when he won that title. And it's the current day NWA title. Yeah, and the best thing about this match, it's like this is how you're supposed to do non-title matches. Like you don't have your number one contender tap six people and then go, all right, if you beat the champion, you get a title match. This was their first night in the company which is why this wasn't a title match. It's like there was their first match in, and they beat this top team. So it's like they're stars immediately. And we go to a promo in studio with the Fantastics, and it's like they're over. That's it. One show. They're over huge. They were over, but oh, my God, this promo. (laughs) Just the most generic. Well, first off, they're out there. They got these blue glittery jackets on. Fucking blue bow ties. The most generic... 80s, baby face, clean shaven, mullets, friendly looking guys, hideous promo. 
We're going to fire it up here in the NWA. I want to thank all the great people out there, all the beautiful women for all your support. The place is going crazy for these two men. Yeah, they were super over, and yeah, super cheesy. They both, yeah, Fulton had a good mullet. Roger, uh, Rogers really just had a starter mullet going. He wasn't full on starter. Uh, he wasn't a full on mullet yet, but he had the had the eighties haircut for sure. They want the Midnight's to sign a contract for the title match, and then as they cut away, they have a. How can I say this in 2018? They had a quick shot of a woman who appeared to be in the very throes of passion watching this here interview. There was a lot of really young women in throes of passion as well in the crowd with with many of the promos in studio. Yes. We then got a Gary Hart promo. Not his greatest promo. No, he was pushing Al Perez. And it's like, there's a guy that just fell off the face of the earth. It's like, he was, you know, good, not great, but it's like, he just seemed to vanish. Well, I guess the story was that they used him here, and then he went to WWE and... Like, when I was a kid, I remember him as being like a jobber. But apparently he was one of those jobbers that he would actually beat other jobbers, but then he wouldn't beat anybody of note. And then he went to WCW, and they had him play the Black Scorpion. And I can't remember who said this, but somebody's claim was that he thought that he was going to be the Black Scorpion. And when he found out that he was losing, he quit. And then he did, like, a few other things and eventually retired. So, I don't know. And Hart called Dusty the Marilyn Monroe of professional wrestling. Do you have any idea what the hell that means? A blonde icon. Ah. With so large breasts. Ah, there you go. I don't know. And they were pushing Perez as the Latin heartthrob, and, and Gary Hart called him the greatest Latin you've ever seen. Yeah. Not Latino. No, Latin. The greatest Latin that you have ever seen in wrestling. Yep, and then we go to what I think was 14-year-old Shane Douglas against Big Bear Collie. Dude, he was like 26. They really? pretended he was 21. He looked 15. Yeah, he did. the road owned this fucking guy over the next <laughs> decade. God yeah, bless cause, him. Because we see him on Nitro uh, on Tuesday in 1999, and he has aged more than 11 years. This was a oh, generic young baby face working arm holds is just death. Yeah, especially because his opponent is Big Bear Collie. He looked like Scott Norton. Just a big dude. Arm bars. <laughs> I was like, dude, it was horrible. It was really bad. We got a drop kick and a belly belly to belly for the win, thankfully in not too many minutes. And I guess they're pushing him as the protege of Magnum TA, so he's using the belly to belly. That's right. Yep. And then we got we got a promo. I actually word for word of a few of these, I had to back them up. But Dusty Rhodes cutting a promo, and there was two moments in particular that I just popped for. He was talking about Hyping the Crockett Cup, and I guess him and uh, Nikita won last year, so we want to tell everybody he did what he did with the million dollars he won. And he said, and I quote, I bought limousines, I ate, spent it on women, I ran around, drank cases of milk after cases of milk for all you children out there. I was heavy duty running wild. Yes. It's not what you make, it's what you save. Unless you're dusty, in which case, it's what you spend. But did he start Not to this... mention this envelope angle. And the first thing he says in this promo is how he spent all of his money on women. Isn't the whole scandal of the envelope, it's proof that he has been, what would the word be? He has not been faithful to his wife. And here he is bragging about all the money he spent on women when he won a million dollars. But halfway through, did he realize he's supposed to be a babyface and decided to throw in the milk for the kids? I think it was just sort of like, you got to throw in something for the kids. Oh, if it wasn't for Dusty's delivery, my God. But the, the next bit in the promo that I, I loved even more, he starts promoting the, the six-man barbed wire match that they're doing at the Clash of Champions. Which, by the way, is this coming Sunday in the timeline we're on. Yes. And he says, and that's that calf killing barbed wire, Jack. That's like if a lady was walking by my ranch and had on a nice-looking pair of pantyhose and just swiveled up into it. I'd be able to see New York City from there. That's the kind of barbed wire that it is. 
I was what baffled. I think I ended up deciphering it after a while. I think that he meant that if she got too close, a hole would be cut in her so deep that he could look through it to New York. No, I think what it meant, and it, it, it makes sense, but then it doesn't really put over the barbed wire. I think he meant that if she swiveled up against the barbed wire, those pantyhose would be cut and he could see her big apple. I, I think see. it was a he could see her ass, which was the big apple, which he said New York City, although I'm not sure hyping the dangerousness of barbed wire sharp sharp enough to cut a pair of pantyhose. Huh. I don't know. It's dusty. The promo felt great because it's Dusty's delivery, but I was like, what the hell is this man talking about? Then he gave us a padded million dollar smile. Walked off. Yep, and then we got Sting versus Joe Cruz, and Sting had my blonde ducktail, although I think it was a, a scorpion tail for him. Yep, that's where I got it, actually. Really? Um, he had, for a very brief period of time, he dale, he daled, he dyed the tail black, and he had the white flat top and the dark tail. And when I broke in as a baby face, I realized that heels want to be able to pull some hair, so I decided to grow it a bit of a tail like Sting did, because I was a big Sting mark, and I bleached mine white to go with my darker hair flat top. How about that? Yes. You and him were interchangeable then, since he was white on top and black tail. You had the black, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. He was a little bit bigger, a little more charismatic. But I, I don't think he was necessarily that much better of a worker than when I started out. But hey. Uh, not based on this, he wasn't. No. Although, thankfully, he had energy. and He, he had more energy than you did when you started Lance. And probably at any point ever in your career. Yes. He was a fiery, more fiery baby face than I ever was ever a day in my life. Uh, which is why I ended up being a heel. And actually enjoyed working with him when I finally got to. So he wins with the Scorpion... More women in the crowd going nuts. Then he does his crazy sting promo. And they've got footage, they say, of something that Ric Flair is going to try to do to him. And it's footage of Flair versus Ricky Santana. And Flair's got him in the figure four. And Ricky starts to fire up and, t- and twist that finger in the air. And he starts to turn and turn And he's almost going to turn that whole damn thing over. And Ric Flair reaches up one hand and he grabs the top rope. And it's just enough to stop Ricky from turning over and he is forced to submit. It was so simple and so awesome. Although, you know what? Interesting story. I believe that match on whatever show it actually aired in its entirety was the very first Ric Flair match I ever saw. Really? And I had heard, you know, about Ric Flair, Ric Flair, Ric Flair, but I'd only seen Hulk Hogan, Hulk Hogan, Hulk Hogan. And I watched that match, and he's bumping around for Ricky Santana. He's getting his ass handed to him by Ricky Santana. And my first thought as a young fan was, this is a crap champion. He's the shits because he's getting beat up by this guy I've never heard of before. That was the thing. Like in the 80s, if you were a fan of WWF, that's what you thought about Flair. If you were a hardcore NWA fan who'd been watching forever, you thought that Flair was awesome. You'd seen enough Flair to know that he actually was great. But that was one of the things about about Rick among fans that weren't hardcore NWA fans. They saw him as a guy that, you know, he's not as good as Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan beats everybody clean. This guy can barely beat anybody. Yeah, and I don't think I'd seen a Flair promo yet, so it's like I just see a guy out here getting his ass kicked, and I'm like, that's no big deal. A um, source was... told me, Lance, that you started watching at that bench press contest. Is that right? Yes, uh, I'm actually your unnamed source. Oh. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, the bench press competition was the first NWA show I saw. I was a gigantic road warrior, Mark, and we never got NWA, and then when I found out we were getting a one-hour NWA show on Saturday, I was so excited, and I watched the first week. I'm like, I'm going to see the Road Warriors, and they're like, the bench press competition. I was so excited, and then Animal got hurt, and I'm like, are you kidding me? It's like the Road Warriors are going to be off the show. I was so hot. Well, they weren't off for long. No, thankfully they weren't. Did was Sting was hyping a cage match here. Was that for the Crockett Cup? Because they didn't do a cage match at the Clash. What the hell was he talking about? Uh, he could have been talking about his buddies. He could have been talking about some random house show match. Him and Flair went all over the place prior to the the Clash. So maybe it, in some arena they had a cage. I, I don't know. I don't know what he was talking about. I never know what he's talking about. 
Yeah. It's one of the weird things with these shows is they plug those, oh, and we'll be having matches in a lot of other towns, and you might not even be champion by the time you get to this big show because they've got to plug those live events. That's right. And by the way, when, when he... Uh, so they got the thing turned over, and then uh, Sting hits the ring, beats the hell out of Flair, Tully tries to make the save, he gets beaten up, Flair tries to go up top, Sting shoves him. It's like a cartoon, the way this one man is just beating up all the heels. Finally, they attack him. Basically, Sting puts Flair in the Scorpion, and he's attacked from behind like a coward, because cowards like Charlotte attack people from behind. They stomp a mud hole in him, and then his promo is, I was beaten, but I'm back, and my dreams are going to come true. I'm not hurt. But they also, because they whacked him with J.J.'s shoe. Yes. And we never saw any blood, but Sting actually said he was bleeding, but he was a tough bleeder. <laughs> it was to explain, I guess, why he didn't have a mark on him. I wonder if Sting was supposed to get color and he didn't. I've I've seen that happen. Yeah, I've had that happen to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sucks. And Keep then gouging at your head and nothing comes out. No, I intended to not get it because I thought it was stupid. And I, I just put a, I put a small scratch in my forehead with my thumbnail and went, I don't know, I just didn't didn't come. I don't know what happened. How about that? Yeah, in, in Europe in 93. Anyway, uh, Jim Crockett then plugs the Crockett Cup, the Clash, and announces that the Fantastics versus the Midnight Express for a title match has been added to the Clash of Champions. And in great timing, we then get Jim Cornette and the Midnight Express for a promo, and... Jim Cornette talks for, I don't know how long, I didn't time it, but like two minutes, never takes a breath, and is just amazing. And did you notice Bobby Eaton when he grabs a pen and paper? That he's wrote like a chapter of the Bible on that thing? I don't know if he was doodling, writing notes, but it's like he's just totally not paying attention to Jim. Well, I think he was signing the contract. Oh, is that what he was I, doing? I think that he was signing the contract, but he was fucking writing for like ten minutes. I thought he was making notes and trying to pop uh, Stan Lane or something. I mean, he may have been. Did You You didn't watch last week's show, did you? No, just listen to it. Oh, yours. God, you should go back and watch that, that Cornette deal where he calls the match and then does an interview and goes for like eight solid minutes, not taking a single breath, and ranting the entire time. This was nothing compared to that. Yeah, Cornette's amazing. We then get the Powers of Pain versus Mac MacGyver and Bob Riddle. Powers of Pain just kill these dudes, and we really just get a top rope headbutt by the Barbarian for the win, and then we get the it was Powers great. of Pain. It was great because you had two jobbers, like not even just like two opponents, two hopeless fucks in that ring. You've got these two giant monsters, the Powers of Pain. Powers of Pain come out with Paul Jones and Ivan Koloff. There's four men out there. Verbally and physically abusing these two poor jobbers. A fantastic group of heels. Yep, and then we get the promo by all four of them. And I got to tell you, Warlord eventually adding paint to his outfit was a big improvement because he has a very dull looking face. He's just a guy. Yep, well, a very Paul big jo one. Very, very large one, yeah. But Paul Jones pushes the, the Bob Wire match. Yes, the Bob Wire. Yes. And then we get Ron Simmons versus Trent Knight. And I swear Ron Simmons looked a little bit older here in 88 than he did in 99 on Nitro. Oh, fuck. Look at look at uh, Teddy Long on this show. And then look at him in 2008 when he's on SmackDown. He looks way younger in 2008, 2009, or whatever year it was, and he looked here. Yeah, I think Ron, just because his hair is longer, he's got a bit bigger of a fro, which makes him look a little bit older. But Ron's just a beast as an athlete. And the announcers are just spending the whole time putting over how great of an athlete is this great newcomer. And they're just putting this guy over as an amazing thing, which he is. And he wins with a modified spine buster, but a good showing for just killing a dude. You know, when we first started watching this, like, I don't know, three years ago or whatever, there was a, there was a, Ronnie Garvin Ric Flair match like a year and a half before Garvin won the title and I don't know when they decided actually I really don't know because I'm not even sure that the long term plan was to make Ron Garvin the champion someone told me that originally the idea was that Jimmy Garvin was going to win the title from Flair but I guess he got something and then he couldn't do it but anyway 
I wonder how long they had it in their mind that Ron Simmons is going to be the champion someday. Because I think he won it like 1990 or 1991, maybe 92. I forget what year it was, but it was a ways, it was a ways down the road. But when he was on the show like a couple months ago, I mean, they sort of began planting the seeds that this man could be a future world champion. They protect him very well. I, I just wonder how long they had that in their minds. Or whether it was just building up. Yeah, who knows? But we, we, we go to a Flair J.J. Dillon promo, and it's funny how much they plug the clash at 4 o'clock. And it's a classic Flair promo. He pretty much promotes the entire clash, and I could watch Flair promos all day. There's a great line where J.J. goes, I see Sting come out here, and he goes, Woo! And he puts his hands up around his mouth, and then he takes his hands away from his mouth, and he holds up to the camera, and he says, This same shape. It stings IQ. And Ric yes. Flair is standing next to him, and he's stone-faced. But as soon as J.J. says Sting's IQ is zero, he cannot help but break into a smile. And then it's on. It says, Sting will find out why there's only one World Heavyweight Champion. Whether you like him or not, he's the best. He's beaten them all. Lives for the chase. The 27th will be the biggest sporting event they'll have ever been involved with. He rattles off. He used to do this in, in WCW as well whenever he would talk about legends of the sport. He starts rattling off every name on the show. Sting, Dusty Rhodes, the Road Warriors, uh, the Midnight Express, Tully, Arn, the Legion of Doom. I'm probably missing a few, but I mean, and that was off the top of my head, actually. He rattles off everybody that's going to be on this show, like, just off the top of his head. And then it suddenly struck me. How much fucking more awesome this card sounded than WrestleMania 4. <laughs> which it's going head to head with. WrestleMania 4 is bad. Dude, he rattles off this talent. I'm thinking about the talent in that tournament. It's like, well, no wonder they destroyed him. Yeah, no doubt. That's one thing that's great about these promos. It's like today, because they're scripted and often rehearsed, you don't see genuine reactions anymore. Because you know J.J. never told Flair what the hell he was going to say. So it's like you get authentic reactions because you don't know what they're going to say. Like if you go back to any of my ECW stuff with Don Marie, she never knew what I was going to say. So all her reactions were real. That's the way it should be done. Yep. We get Jim Crockett announcing that Luger and Wyndham are going to challenge Tully and Arn for the world tag titles at the Clash. Because that Clash is so much better than Mania 4. And we then get the Road Warriors versus El Negro and Steve Atkinson. And El Negro is, I guess, translated into the Negro. And he's really just a big black dude with a mask on. Unbelievable. Yes. Animals in the goalie mask. And this is just beat the hell out of him in 15, 20 seconds and hit the doomsday device. This was just look how impressive these deep, big two crazy dudes are. And that's exactly what got them over and why I loved them so much. I did love Animal's hockey mask, the visual, but it fucking was bad when he had to cut a promo. I could not understand <laughs> a word this guy said. Yeah, he he's mumbling, you can't make out a word, and then Hawk, who wasn't mumbling, was so weird with his promo, I had almost no idea what he was saying. He said he would write some poems, and I think he said something about monkey zits, but other than that, I didn't catch much. I didn't understand his poem, but he did have one good line where he says... The Clash will be the night of the living dead, because we'll be living, and you'll be dead. So I can't get yes. away with that today. That was something yes, else. Yes, that was a good clothesline. Did you notice that Hawk had a bad bad boat with a razor when he shaved his head that day? There was mm. a lot of nicks in the top of his head. Never good. Nope. We then got Lex Luger versus... Pause Kane. right there, Lance, my friend. Yes. So all of you that have been listening to these reviews, you know that during each commercial break... A graphic comes up on the screen, and it has some words, some little nuggets of wisdom for you. Stay tuned! The best wrestling is right here. Or, I don't remember what the other ones are, but they're all generic whatevers. So, they go to commercial after this Road Warriors promo, and there's a, there's a still shot of Lex Luger. And do you know what it said at the bottom of the screen? I didn't catch it. It says... Next, luscious Lex Luger. 
No way. I swear to God. I thought I was imagining things. So I'm looking at this graphic that says, coming up next, luscious Lex Luger. They go to break the comeback. Lex is coming down to the ring. Tony Schiavone says, and I quote, Buddy, all I can say is that package is loaded. <laughs> what is going on here? That he killed this Andrew Bellamy. This was yes. bizarre. Yeah, this was, again, Luger hit a few moves. He posed a lot. He did that weird breathing that he always does, but the girls at ringside loved him, and he was super over, and it's like, that rack is always over. Yeah! Despite the fact that Andrew Bellamy does not know how to time getting picked up and, like, sack of shit at him on, like, two lifts. Yes. Yeah, this this Luger, he's always over. Like, he's, except when he does his fucking long-ass promos, but... I mean, in the ring, he always gets a pop. He always gets over. And they just ruin him at every turn. Yep. And Spam then we get the... slam of the week. <laughs> yes. Hawk having to press that dude that went up heavy for him, I guess, last week. Oh, dude, he deserved this spam slam of the week for that one. Yeah, and then we get to follow up with a Barry Windham and Lex Luger promo. That same girl from earlier in the throes of passion. They found her again. She's still in the throes of passion for Luger and Wyndham. Found out they're getting this title shot. Wyndham is not a great promo, but you know what? He gets in and gets out. He says what needs to be said, and he's done. Then they go to Luger, and he just won't shut up. He keeps circling the wagons looking for his outline and never finds it. Dude, get to the point, dude. <laughs> He even starts plugging other matches. Yeah. Too much. Yep. And then we get uh, Al Perez with uh, Gary Hart with him and Tony Suber. And I think the only thing worse than a baby face working arm ringers and arm holds is a heel doing it. Well, you see, like three weeks ago, Tony Suber won a match. He's He's been a perennial jobber. And out of the blue... There was a new guy that was supposedly debuting that they put in a fancy outfit to make you think that he was actually the star. And Tony Suber beats the guy. And the place goes crazy because Tony Suber won a match. And then they just never did anything with him ever again. Here he's just in this match here, and he loses again to Al Perez. Yeah, the only good thing about Al Perez being so boring in this match is it gave J.R. and Tony a lot of time to talk about him and put him over. That's true. But he did nothing until he hit a forearm off the ropes and then one with a spinning toe hold. The spinning, the old school championship spinning toe hold. On the right leg. That's right, it was on the right leg. <laughs> it was. I'm like, wow, way to get a new guy over. The worst finishing move. Again, back when Dory did it, it was over. But it's like in 1988, following like the Road Warriors and the Powers of Pain, do we need a spinning toe hold? Especially I don't know. when Flair does a spinning toe hold into the figure four leg lock. It's like an advanced version of it, and you're trying to get over this just a spinning toe hold. I don't know. Yep. And then they do a promo. And it looks like Seth Rollins, kind of. I thought the same thing. Yeah. Not nearly as good of a worker, though. No, and he can't talk to save his life. No, and he's, he looks lost standing behind Gary when Gary cuts his promo. And Hart cuts the promo on Dusty, and did you catch when he said, Your time has come, Virgil? Yes! He's shooting, brother. What's he's going using on real here? Names. That's two in one show. Yeah, it's, it's, you got to let them know that this is this is a, a shoot this time. It's for real. Your time's up, Virgil. And then when, when Perez gets to talk, the first words out of his mouth are, well, let me tell you something. And I'm just like, wow, dude, you really need to work on your promos. And that's coming from me. Yes, Al Perez. That was his real name. So I guess, you know. Do you remember what his finisher was when he wasn't using the, the spinning toe hold? The, I, can't, I can't imagine him having one. He actually won? He had a move called the Alleycopter. Oh, yeah, he had the um, uh, Christians. No. The Unprettier. Or no, 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 never mind. That was somebody else. That was... Uh, he he had him up like it was for the for Razor's Edge. And then he would spin him. Like he would do like a giant swing type spinning for himself with the guy up in the Razor's Edge. And then he'd duck his head and throw the guy. And the guy would spin like a helicopter propeller and take the bump. And it was the Alleycopter. How about that? Yeah. Al. Way better. Ali. Al Perez. The yes. alleycopter. 
Yep. And then we get the Midnight Express. Actually, against... before we get to that, all right. there's one other line here. So he's cutting his promo, and they're challenging Dusty for the United States title. And Gary Hart says that if Al Perez cannot beat Dusty for the United States title, he, Gary Hart, will jump off the highest tower in Atlanta. <laughs> He's going to commit suicide. I I hope no one held him to that because I'm Al not Perez sure. never won the title. Al Perez beats Dusty Rhodes. This was a way better promo than the first one. Yeah, although Perez even botched his closing line and Gary had to take it from him. All right, the Midnight Express versus Mike Jackson and Alan Martin, and you could tell they liked Mike Jackson. Hell yeah, everybody did. He was awesome. Yep. Even let Jim, Jim Cornette body slam him. Well, he it, Cornette from ringside starts cutting a promo on Mike Jackson, and then Bobby gives him like a giant high spot. He's monkey flipping. He's doing a flying head scissor. It was great. And then Bobby caught his feet, slingshot him over the top rope, and Jim Cornette body slammed him on the cement. So they, they liked Mike Jackson. Mike Jackson could work, so they worked with him for a bit, and then they let Alan Martin tag in, and they went to town and beat the hell out of him. Cornette's half at ringside, half doing commentary. and It was again, awesome on commentary. First off, I think Cornette on our show said that the Midnights liked to do stuff in their matches on TV, so if they had a guy that could actually do stuff, they do stuff with him. And I think if you watch like a lot of the Midnight matches... You can see the times where they figured a guy could do something, and so they came up with some ideas, and if he could do them, they did it, but if he fucked it up, which invariably they did like 50% of the time, the Midnights would just kill him. So Mike Jackson was not going to screw this thing up. No, and Cornette did an awesome job to put over how upset he was that they lost this non-title match. It's like he was more upset about this and like a thousand times more upset than most guys are when they actually lose the titles. Yeah, and one of the great things about it is he's so good at talking that when he cuts a promo and he's stumbling all over himself, it's even more meaningful. Like, he's sitting there on commentary. First off, he starts screaming that there's no way the Fantastics could even win. And... David Crockett's like, they did win. They beat you clean in the middle. And then he's like, well, they won, but they didn't win. He's just losing his mind trying to dance around the fact that they actually lost to him. And he's stumbling all over himself. It was it was great. Yeah, he was purposely overselling the no-sell. Yes. Tr trying to come off with a guy that wants to deny that they lost and that it bothers him. But you can tell it's eating him alive that these guys beat his boys. It was awesome. They won with a rocket launcher, and then we got a Fantastics promo yet again, because you know you want the Fantastics doing two promos in one night, but thankfully it was just for the show closing angle. Cornette comes out to confront them, the Midnights jump them, and then they brawl for the last several minutes of the show. Did they In ever? the ring, on the floor, using chairs, tennis rackets. One point, Tommy Rogers does a standing drop kick oh. on the concrete. So, I was reading about... Tommy Rogers, because he passed away a couple of years ago. And apparently, like, he was in his mid-50s, maybe 56 or something like that. And he was just in tons of pain. And he needed, like, a double hip replacement and some other things. And he had to take all of these this pain medication to try to make it through the day. I'm reading about all of this. And I literally look up, and he does this drop kick on the cement. And he leaps in the air. He hits the drop kick. His body turns, and he literally fell flat on his stomach, knees, hips, just directly on the concrete. And I just thought, well, first off, like, don't do this. But second off... I mean, as dangerous as it looked, I mean, we see people splatting on the outside all the time nowadays. And granted, there's usually a mat, but there's not always a mat. And they're doing it far more frequently. I'm just kind of, I don't know. I guess we'll see what happens. Hopefully, Did, it's not too bad, but I think it's going to be rough the next couple decades for a lot of guys. Did you see the, the GIF or video that Craig shared on Twitter just 
tonight. No. Of PCO power bombing a guy over the top rope onto the floor. There's a mat, but he takes the power bomb over the top rope and just lands high on his shoulders on the floor. And it's Dude. Like, yeah, there's going to be some uh, some beat up sore bodies uh, in years to come. I mean, I'm listen, afraid. I don't want to mention any names, but there were a lot of older wrestlers at StarCast. There were a lot of younger guys, but there were also some older guys. And there were some older guys who, they they don't look good. They can barely move. They never did any of this shit. And I'm not talking like, like old, old. I mean, they're old, but, you know, we're talking 50s, 60s. A lot of them not even their 60s. There's a giant fucking spider on my wall right now. Nice. No, not running. nice. Just went behind. God damn it. I hate spiders. I was in the middle of a very passionate from the heart rant and a giant spider crawled out from behind that curtain and then went behind the curtain again. So now I'm going to have to go find it. Or, or get your tiny blonde wife to save you. I'll uh, get the cats. There you go. Yeah. But they, they go off the air with this brawl. And this was a great show. It's like it opened up with the tease of the Midnights and the Fantastics, and it's like this show got this feud and this match over so big. And it was awesome. I, I enjoyed it. And I can also see, like watching the show, how you could attract new fans with this kind of yes. show. All the segments are short. You get to see all of the guys win. And if one of these guys grabbed your attention, whether it's, you know, luscious Lex Luger or you think the Road Warriors are crazed maniacs, it's like, or Dusty's promo or Flair's promo, it's like it's so easy to grab someone's imagination and attention in a short little segment that, and they do a, such a good job of explaining stuff. It's like you're not confused for a second and you get a taste of so many great flavors. I love this show. Well, it's not only that, but if you watch this show, pick your favorite guy. Could be the Road Warriors. Could be Sting. Could be Ric Flair. It's not a business like WWE today where we're going to pick your guy. And yes. that's it. Like, we're going to pick your guy. If you don't like the guy we've picked, invariably your guy is going to lose a bunch of matches and probably at some point be such a geek that Brian and Tom are going to chop him. There's nothing like that. Can you imagine doing a chopping block for the NWA? Who the fuck would we chop besides jobbers every week? Yeah, that's the thing is they're all on, for the most part, a level playing field because everybody gets their one to four minutes to do whatever the hell you want in the ring and go over. And then you get one to three minutes to say whatever the hell you want to try to get yourself over. So if you have the ability to get yourself over, you're going to get yourself over. Yeah, they and wanted everybody to get over. That's how they made their fucking money. Not like we want a guy to get over. And we want a girl to get over. And everybody else we could give a shit less if they ever get over. Because we're just going to make money one way or the other. That's why this show is so enjoyable. You can pick your favorite and stick with them. And for the most part, they'll they'll your support will be paid off if they're baby faces that you pick. Or heels as well. Yeah, and really, and that you, you can't go back to it, but it's like... You might get a couple of live events that you could go to in your town or a couple of big events you see on the show. So it's like, even if your favorite guy loses every big match, you still see him win 75% of his matches. Exactly. Yep. So there you go, everybody. That's the NWO. Throw the... Uh... So let's get funky like a monkey. Get ready. Oh, I'm ready. Let's do this. NWA uh, haven't you learned by now after all these years? You know I should have. Yes, just go along with it, dude. It's have. up to the fuckheads on the board to tell me how stupid I am, not you. NWA World Championship Wrestling for March 26th, 1988. And I mean that in the nicest way possible. The fuckheads <laughs> on the board. It's really only a small handful of fuckheads. Everyone else I really appreciate and love. So usually the show opens, there is a... A match going on, or a brawl, or a promo, and it cuts Something. off. It cuts off at a key point, and then later they show you what happened after that key point. This week they opened with Nikita Koloff killing some geek with a sickle. Then he killed another geek with a sickle. Yeah. Then he killed a third geek with a sickle. And it was great at the time, but looking back on it, Nikita never again appeared on the show. Well, they were just alerting us that he was back. He is still around. 
Yeah. I don't remember. I don't think he's around much longer, honestly. But No, it's a brief return. Yeah. There's a lot going on here in the NWA in 1998. So the theme of this show is that even though the Clash of Champions was tomorrow, the Crockett Cup was a much bigger deal. It wasn't on this show. And frankly, that wasn't the biggest deal going on either, as we shall get to. I couldn't figure out why this wasn't all about the Clash. I don't know. Like, did they just figure, well, everyone's going to watch it. Let's just do something else. They did all... Anyway. I couldn't figure it out. There was, like, there was nothing to build to the Clash. I mean, think about all these Raw shows. They're like shitty go-home shows. They're still better than this go-home show. As a go-home show, this was awful. There was literally an interview with Flair. Uh, Flair mentioned which it. mostly he talked about Penthouse. Mm-hmm. There was an interview with Sting where it was the worst Sting interview of all time, and he, he didn't want to be there. He didn't want to talk, talk about it. No. And that was it. Uh, and they, they plugged somewhere in here uh, that the seedings, the top seedings, the Crockett Cup would be announced at the Clash. Yeah, who gives a shit? So you, you, even that is just using the Clash as a vehicle to promote something else. So we had the Sheep Herders versus Ryan Wagner and Tony Bowman. So the announcers are not talking about the Clash. They're talking about the Crockett Cup. So the Crockett Cup tournament is going to be a 24-team tournament. It's an offensive tournament. It, and as they have mentioned, it's an offensive tournament. Yes. It's going to be held over two nights. Yes. And uh, the, in addition to the tournament, there's going to be a singles main event in each night. And they had already announced, I think they would already announced, that night two would have the world championship on the line in a yet-to-be-determined title match. Mm-hmm. But now we, now we know the main event for night one. Jimmy Garvin, Jimmy Garvin versus Kevin Sullivan in, quote, a Prince of Darkness death match. Yes. And they noted nobody knew what these tips were, but Garvin had signed the contract anyway. Uh, foolish baby face. That sounds honestly straight out of Raw from any era almost. Yeah, basically. Listen, I love the sheep herders. They beat these two fuckers up for, like, five hours. <laughs> a long time. And I love to watch the sheep herders beat people up, but this was too much even for me. They beat on him. They beat on him. They beat on him. They beat on him. Announcers are talking about the Crockett Cup. Announcers are talking about how disgusted they are that the sheep herders and Johnny Ace have the temerity to bury America. They beat on him. They beat on him. And all I could think was, I need to watch some old WWF. Because I know that these guys were clowns as the Bushwhackers. Oh, yeah, yeah. But when they got in there for squashes on primetime wrestling, did they beat the shit out of jobbers the way these guys did, or were they totally clowns? I think there's a lot more marching and licking. Sure, yeah. I got a thing going on. I need, le- I need to go back and watch this. Le- le- less severe violence. But man, it just took forever to get to the point, which was they beat him with a double gut They, they, they hit a finish in one. Yeah. <laughs> it just wasted all our time. The only thing I can add to this is the, the setup... For the gut buster was the battering ram, which I think may have been the finish as the bushwhackers, but yeah, you batter, you battering ram them in the gut, you batter, you ram them <laughs> in a battering manner in the gut, and then you do a double gut buster. Yeah, the point is, it makes sense. Sure, you soften up their gut with the battering ram, and then you bust it, and you bust their gut with the gut buster. Right. Yeah. I just want to mention they fucking rammed this guy. Hey. This is a highway collision. He just ran him over. And then the moment they won, in the audience, there was a hot 80s chick oh. with the most preposterous hair, and she just had to take her jacket off. She just stood up to slowly remove her red jacket, it was r- just, red leather jacket. It was too hot in the building after this finish. Yes, revealing her, her, her crop top. and I, With her hair and her hairspray, I assure you she was taller than Barry Windham. Yes. She was, Giant 80s hair. Speaking of Barry Windham, the Twin Towers come out for a promo. Here was a Clash plug. They're fighting Tully and Arn of the Clash. They're going to win the titles. The Twin Towers. Yeah, that name didn't last long. <laughs> no, it went to well, team the big long, boss but... man and Akeem the that's African true. Dream. That's a very different team. Yes. Every time I hear the Twin Towers, I expect those guys to come out. But then it's Windham and Luger. I'm trying to decide if that's an upgrade or not. <laughs> Promo wise, no. Yeah, Akeem no... and Big Boss Man would do a way better promo. And slick, yes, Don't forget slick for sure. Slick. So they said they've got the Horsemen right where they want them. They're going to win the titles tomorrow at the Clash. They're going to go on and win the Crockett Cup because it's a much bigger deal. And then at the end, Lex just had to take his shirt off, and all Wyndham could do. Of course, was, he did. All Wyndham could do was laugh, envy. Bring Wyndham has. 
Lex Luger is talking about the Clash, and he's so excited to be on national TV. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> what, what, what am I watching on now? You're on national TV every week and at this exact moment, Luger. Yeah. Are you aware of that? It's on the same fucking channel you're on right now. Rob Garner. And by the way, the mm. question David asked them. You didn't even talk about the question David presented them with. I did not. Wyndham and Luger come out. They're fighting for the World Tag Team titles tomorrow. David says, do you guys think you'll win mm. the World Tag Team titles? That was the question. <laughs> Their answer was, you know, we do. <laughs> we think that we can win those titles. A pressing question. Always playing hardball. David Crockett is. Rob Garner of the National Wrestling, Alli- National Wrestling Alliance came out with some announcements. First, he was there to announce new teams for the Crockett Cup. Mm. They were teams from Japan and Mexico. Wow. It's like the mixed match classic. That's all the information we have. Yes. Talked about the Prince of Darkness match. Yes. He said on night two, there will be a world championship match. At this point, who should interrupt with the world heavyweight champion, the nature boy Ric Flair, accompanied by a lovely young blonde? Now listen, Vinny. Mm-hmm. Every time we watch these old shows from the 80s, mm-hmm. and these women come out, mm-hmm. you salivate over them every time. You love these 80s women. I love 80s women, it's true. I could not possibly care less. I don't live in the past. Mm-hmm. But when this girl came out, <laughs> I was like, she is exceptionally gorgeous. Oh, she Who was. is this? I uh, thought I thought that he just randomly in all sincerity, found a really, really good-looking woman. In all sincerity, I'm so happy you asked. So Flair said, this is Patty Mullen, the pet of the year. Yeah. Now, I'm sure Tony knows, pet of the year is the uh, penthouse model of the year. Yeah. Did you part. notice, by the way, mm-hmm. they would not allow the word penthouse. No. On this show. Just pet of the year. Every time somebody said the words penthouse, it was bleeped out. That's really weird. Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> so Patty Mullen. Patty Mullen, pet of the year. Now, it was my duty, my responsibility, and my obligation to confirm this claim. That Patty Mullen was actually the pet of the year in 1987. She it was. was. It was 88. I've, I've checked, and there are, in fact, photographs of her with no clothing on from her photo shoots. Oh. They're out there. Just so I didn't know. see any of that. And then I did some more researching. She also had an acting career. Yes. She was the star, the title character, in one of the most famous exploitation films, notorious, I should say, notorious exploitation films of all time, Frankenhooker. With Tony furiously typing over there. <laughs> it just, I have seen this, actually. It's been a long time, but I have seen Frank and Hooker. It's just what it sounds like. I'm just going to share this little anecdote from the Wikipedia page for Frank and Hooker. So they wanted this film to get an R rating, but they wanted to, to get away with everything they could and still get an R rating. So as they're negotiating with the MPAA, they get a phone call, and they're told, Congratulations, you're the first film rated S. He said... S for sex and they said no for shit <laughs> wow <laughs> wow so there you go this is the kind of talent Ric Flair was hanging out with in 1988 it sounds like a potpourri <laughs> it's been a long time but I, 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 sh- I I'm not sure I want to watch it with you Vinny I hesitate to say I've seen I, I may movies. have to tie you up or something I liked Maybe. it a lot when I was 18 I don't know if I would like it so much at 42 yeah I'm afraid I'm afraid that we may have to just Watch it separately and report? It's something like that. Yeah. I, I don't want you in my room when this is on. Yeah, that's fair. So, Flair is bragging about the woman he's hanging out with and talking about how... She actually did a very good job. She had, like, two lines to speak. She, she wasn't just standing there as, like, a, a mannequin. No. Like, she responded she, to what he being, said. Yes. Yeah, she looked at him. She smiled. She had lines. She mm-hmm. did a good job. I don't know why Frank and Hooker could be so bad. So, Flair is ranting and raving about how... Sting and Wyndham and Lex were jealous of him for the woman he was hanging out with, and she said, "He says I was watching the five minutes ago, and Lex Luger tore his shirt off, and Patty turned to me and she said, real women don't like muscle men; they like men of the world.' Which I guess is Flair, <laughs> He's the a man, man of, the, of world. the world. And as they're leaving, he turned to Tony and says, "If you come along, she's got a friend for you too." Wow, <laughs> this was awesome. Yeah, Flair with Patty Mullen by his side was even more excited than usual. That he was he was so excited. If you were to tell him Rick Flair we're going to take either Patty Mullen or your world championship belt away, he'd say take the fucking belt. 
Well, I'll just win another one. Al Perez versus Alan Martin. So there was a point during this match. You missed the whole sentence. You only heard groin muscle. Okay? <laughs> okay. Yeah. The actual line, Al Perez does some sort of maneuver, and David Crockett said he was, and I quote, pulling right on the groin muscle. Mm. I didn't go back. I, I don't. I don't want to know what was happening. No. So, I guess Al Perez debuted last week. The show yes. I missed, but I kind of remember Al, and he was pretty much like I remember. Great physique. Seemed very uh, athletic and 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 trained in the ring. Uh, uh, trained, obviously, but you know, uh, he seemed like an athletic guy, and he was a technical wrestler. Yes. All he did was grapple this guy. Yes. Wrestled him and wrestled him and wrestled him, and then won clean with a finish. Why are we supposed to boo him? Just because Gary Hart is there. It's the only mm-hmm. reason. And he killed he's, Alan Martin. He's tall, dark, and handsome, literally. He wrestled and wrestled him. He did elbow Alan Martin right in the face. He did the old flying forearm, the Tito Santana flying burrito, I believe, that mm-hmm. Bobby Heenan called it, and just elbowed this guy right in the face. It went through his head, I'm pretty sure. That should have been the finish. And he had his spinning toe hold and, and won. It was a fun squash. Paul Bosch. Yeah. 1988, Paul Bosch says, I'm going on national TV. i got to get dressed up. He gets a red jacket. Yeah. With the biggest damn butterfly collar you ever saw. 88, I say, not 78. Gold tips on the collar, which is out by his shoulders. Big giant medallion on his bare chest. (laughs) Paul Bosch, baby. The man. Fashion icon. The absolute man. He'd been at the penthouse mansion. He may, he looked like it, actually. This, this is a Bob Guccione outfit, if ever there was one. So the other fellow was a Peter Burkholtz. You know, I once wrote for penthouse. You did. That's yes. true. Do you have an outfit like this? No. Well, that's where they fired you. Yeah. So Peter Burkholtz was there to represent Houston wrestling, and he pathetically tried to plug a card in Houston, and they gave him about four seconds of air time and said, okay, let's talk about the Clash in the Crockett Cup. And that was that. Fantastics versus Steve Atkinson and Gene Ligon. You know, I liked Paul Bosch on commentary. Paul Bosch on commentary did a fine job. He was he was a little slow, but he made some good points. Noted that forearm shots are actually more dangerous than punches because when you throw a punch, you can break your hand. Yes. Correct. Correct. Uh, did the fan, were the Fantastics on last week's show? Yes. So you got the, sure were. I can't tell you how happy I am. That the Fantastics original music, complete with their custom intros, yes. is still intact on the network. That is great news. So they come out in their bow ties and their tails. They hug literally every female who wants a hug. And Bobby Fulton, throughout the, from, from, from entrance to exit, he will not stop wiggling his hips, and the women always scream. They're just the whitest of white meat baby faces. So this went on for a long time. Too long. They did a lot of stuff. It was, it was not the usual Shane Douglas, Ricky Santana, let's do an armbar for eight minutes match, but it went too long. Highlight was Bobby Fulton sitting in the crowd and doing some cheerleading and all went crazy for him. And then finally they hit the rocket launcher for the win. The Midnight Express's uh, own rocket launcher. And Paul Bosch, almost a fable, he said, you have to take chances if you want to win. Mm. They took a chance. Mm-hmm. And they won. They did. Wise man, that Paul Bosch. Yes. So the fans... Mentor to our own Dave Meltzer in some that's, ways. That's true. That's true. So the fans are going crazy, and the Fantastics are pumping them up. And they say, we're not stealing the Midnight Express's moves. We're just showing we can do them better. And they ran down Bobby. They ran down Stan. They ran down Cornette. They ran down Mama Cornette. And by the time this is done, I couldn't wait for that match. Yeah. The promo was great. Squash just went too... The match just went too long. So they go back to... I thought this was it for Paul Bosch. He'd, no, he's he back speech. for more. He, he, he was very familiar familiar with the Fantastics and the Minute Express. Yes. So I thought they brought him in to do guest commentary for that match. No, now he's just on camera doing a long ramble. Not even a rant, just a ramble. All he had to say, mm-hmm. all he had to say was teams should obey the rules. Well, that's actually all he did say. It just took him 7,000 words oh, to say it. Oh, my God. God, was it a struggle to get this out. But you know what? He just kept trying <laughs> till he got it all out. And then he wasn't red. He wasn't embarrassed. He just matter-of-factly looked into the camera. 
I said my piece. What's next? Yes. So they showed a match between the Twin Towers and the Four Horsemen with Magnum T on commentary. So J.J. Dillon at one point tried to interfere. Magnum left the commentary desk to menace him with a baseball bat to prevent this interference. So Magnum has his right hand in his pocket because he can't even use that arm. Mm -hmm. He's very, very tentative on his feet. And he's holding the baseball bat with his left hand. Now, clearly he's a righty. Mm. And not only that, he's only got one hand. Yeah. So, J.J. tries to interfere, and poor Magnum T.A. has to whack him with the baseball bat. He has to whack him with a baseball bat using his wrong arm and, not and only him. one hand. It's the weakest. It's just so sad. See, I'll be honest. I thought that he just merely scared him. Well, he swung the bat at him, and JJ ducked out of the way. Regardless, what happened next was uh, somebody was trying to sunset flip Tully, and Tully was reaching for the ropes. And instead of grabbing the ropes, he grabbed the bat. Yeah. So Tully and Magnum had a bit of a tug of war, and it, as Tully yanked the bat, the bat hit him in the chest and knocked him down. And the ref was about to count three, but then a second ref ran in and said, "No, no, no." Magnum T.A. hit Tully Blanchard with a baseball bat. That is a disqualification. Dude, these fuck finishes are like... They're so creative, but they're such they're bullshit. They're still such bullshit. Dude. So they go back to the studio. They go to a break and they come back, and Magnum's in the studio Thank with Thank God Vince bat. McMahon is not watching these old shows. There's so much heat to be generated <laughs> watching these old 98 shows, or 88 shows. So, so many ways to fuck a man. So Magnum is there to cut a promo, and by the end of this is actually, a, I think it's pretty famous. I remember this vividly. Uh, but the first half of what happens next is just so sad. Magnum says, yes, I have a baseball bat. I have an equalizer. I don't like to use it, but I'm not 100% yet. Someday the day will come when I'm ready to get back in that ring, and I won't need this bat anymore. Spoiler alert, that day never came. Yeah. Says, I am no commentator. I'm a warrior, and the warrior still lives inside me. At this point, Tully and JJ come out. Which, by the way, it's kind of sad because this was a great promo, and it's sad that he just couldn't continue on as a commentator. Yeah. Because he probably would have been a great commentator and had a job for like a decade. I think he did, actually. He at did some, on and at off. At some point. But it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't like, it could have been more. Okay. So Tully and JJ are pissed. They're, of course, pissed about the incident where Magnum hit Tully with a bat that they just showed. And Tully is also pissed that now they're selling VHS tapes and probably Betamax as well. Yeah. Of the I Quit match where Tully says, they're paying you money off of me saying I quit, which never happened. So Tully cuts a promo on him. He's outraged by all this. He's, and he wants, uh, he's stating his mind and... It's getting tense. And Barry Windham comes out to stand up for Magnum because Magnum can barely stand for himself. T Tully drops Barry with a punch, which in hindsight, what a geek Barry Windham turned out to be here. Mm. And then, JJ, here, here's, here's what was your, you're supposed to think happened. And I'll tell you what actually happened. JJ grabbed Magnum TA to hold him for a punch so Magnum could not defend himself until they could get a cheap shot. What actually happened was, J.J. had to hold Magnum so he didn't fall down. And after this punch was thrown, lower him very gently to the floor so Magnum didn't break his back again. Yes. It's so obvious as a grown-up watching this. And yes. And it's so sad. Yes. They had to take this guy who could barely stand and have him do anything physical whatsoever. Well, the thing was, I'm sure that Magnum wanted to do this. He probably did. I'm sure he requested. You know how I know that he wanted and requested to do this? Because what you didn't see on TV is now that he take that bump, he gigged. We never even saw it. I didn't even notice. Yep, he just wanted to be a part of something. And yeah. they actually, they set it up in such a way that they allowed him to do something. Mm -hmm. And they made sure that he was safe. And they got him out of the way. And he so, got to do his angle. So Wyndham is down, Magnum is down. Tully starts getting the mount on Magnum and throwing punches. And out comes the most angry, dusty roads you've ever seen in your life. And Dusty grabbed Tully, 
And he grabbed this baseball bat, and he just unleashed hell. He sure did. Holy shit. I can't tell you how many times I've been watching wrestling, especially... It, it was This was a big deal in 1988. On the, you know, the Attitude Era, it was a segment. One of a, one of a thousand each week. But I've seen a hundred baseball bat attacks. None of them were as believable as this. Yeah, Dusty tried to kill him with a baseball Dusty bat. Dusty was a fucking madman, swinging it, this bat hither and yon. And he almost and, he almost hit Magnum at one point. Almost hit Magnum, almost hit me. Barry was ducking out of the way. Yep. Totally wild scene. D D D Dylan's running for his life. They did a spot where Jim Crockett runs out on Dusty's back. Dusty just throws him he down. He leaps onto his back. Yeah. He doesn't just throw him. He leaps on his back. Dusty doesn't know who it is, so Dusty swings the bat and hits Jim Crockett Jr., the promoter of Crockett Promotions. He goes down. This is the big one. He killed Jim Crockett Jr. He did. Forget about all this other stuff. Jim Crockett Jr. never was involved in these angles. No, 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 ever. He tries to jump on this guy's back. He takes the big bump. The whole babyface locker room comes out. Jim Crockett didn't even do verbal confrontations. No. He was... The, the the promoter. But this was out of control, and he had to do something about it. And he paid and the he price. took a bullet. Yes, he did, exactly. So Dusty takes Tully down. He's choking him with a bat. Every baby face in the history of the earth appears. He's basically doing a rear naked choke with a bat, with the hooks in. Yes, yes. This is a serious choke. They all come out to try and pull him off, and they're still trying, actually, as they go to break. They may still be trying right now. They might be, yeah. So what I rem remember most about this, why it was so vivid to me, as I was watching this with my dad, and I was a wrestling fan, and my dad was not. And my dad just took the, the evidence that Tully Blanchard was still alive as the fact this must be fake. And if you saw this attack, you'd understand. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. If, you, if you do hit a man with a baseball bat over and over, he will probably die. That's true. But it was great. <laughs> it was still great. So finally they go to break, and they come back, and everyone's still just out of it. This was, this was a big deal. The, 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 and the situation has calmed down. They do have contracted matches to, 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 to produce, but the, the camera work's not quite right. There's no one entrances. I don't think there were graphics. The announcers are still trying to get settled. The fans are still trying to catch their breath. It's the Varsity Club versus the Italian Stallion and Tommy Angel. And even the Varsity Club were off their game by the chaos. Rick Steiner's out there getting backdropped and power-bombed in 1988. Rotunda's getting run wild. Sullivan can only shake his head in disappointment. And finally, the, the uh, varsity club, I should say, took over, beat these guys up, and Rotunda had a butterfly suplex and won. Tommy Angel's atrocious. He's not very good. You weren't here last week, so I'll tell you what I... I'll tell you the scoop I got from Kevin Sullivan on the airplane. Yes. I told Lance this. He explained that in the mid-'80s, I guess I screwed up, and it was Animal House was the movie in the late 70s, not Roadhouse. I screwed up my houses. Yeah. But anyway, very famous movie, and a lot of kids watched the movie, and they wanted to go to college. Animal House, yes. They wanted to do crazy shit. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of crazy shit in the mid-80s. Sure was. A lot of drugs, a lot of drinking in these, in these uh, fraternities. Mm -hmm. And so Kevin Sullivan's idea, the whole varsity club gimmick was, these were two guys in college. And basically, he was their dealer. Okay. He was getting them all fucked up all the time. This, And then that's why you had a devil-worshipping crazy guy mm -hmm. running around with these two college athletes. This makes total sense. It does! When he told me, I was like, why the fuck did I never think of that? <laughs> if, you watch, if you watch the difference between Varsity Club Mike Rotunda and Florida Champion Mike Rotunda, he's on very different drugs. Yes! He is, he's no longer on lewds. That was like the storyline now. In storyline. Now let me talk about this Kevin Sullivan promo because it was so awesome. Not as... That's hard to say. I can't... Like, the Jim Cornette promo later was better in some ways, but it was like a total joke. Yes. It was over the top. Kevin Sullivan says, what you saw today was Dusty Rhodes snapping. I knew it was going to happen. I didn't think... His dark side would take over like it did today, but it did. He's a madman. He says, Dusty did not just try to whack Tully. He tried to end his life. He tried to kill him. Mm -hmm. If this had happened someplace else, he'd have been locked up for 90 days and tested to see if he was criminally insane. This was the act of a terrorist, he says. Yep. He says, people call me all sorts of terrible things. They call me all these horrible names, but I liked what I saw in Dusty today. We witnessed a madman on the loose. He took this bat. 
He was trying to bash Tully's brains out. But you know what? He should call somebody. He needs help. I loved it. He also said Tully should get a lawyer. He would have a great case. <laughs> Fuck yeah, he'd have a great case. <laughs> you can't do that. You kidding that. me? Are you kidding? It was an amazing promo. I do love how Sullivan's promos are always focused on Dusty, and Dusty never cares about him. Yeah. yeah. Ron Simmons versus David Diamond. He's no idiot. He explained the Dungeon of Doom, mm -hmm. all these goofy cartoon characters. He says, I had to build Hulk's trust. Mm. And what he was used to in the 80s was facing big cartoon characters and winning. So I created a stable of them. Well, he got some of the same individuals. For him to beat. <laughs> yeah. And he gained his trust. Yeah. Sullivan's a very wise man. That's true. He's a very wise man. That is he true. He does still think that he beat Goldberg in his first ever match. Mm. Which is, there's nothing. I, I don't know what he's talking about. He always says this. But that's a story. So Ron Simmons versus David Diamond. For about one minute, this was awesome. They shook hands... And then Ron Simmons just murdered him violently over and over and over again. And then I don't know what happened, but he stopped. They started doing holds. Long fucking holds. I'll do a Boston Crab for an hour. I'll do a bow and arrow for an hour. This went on and on and on the show, which I had not hated until this point, just ground to a halt. Not only that, he has a long, boring match. Then he cuts a promo where he just says, I don't want to talk about this right now, and he walks off. I'm like, this is the go-home show. You showed me every aspect of Sting I don't want to see. You jumped ahead a segment. We're talking about Ron Simmons. Oh. Well, the same thing with Sting and Max MacGyver. Yeah. I heard long, boring match where nothing happened, and I presume we were talking about the Sting match. But you're right. The, the same Sting match went a minute. fucking thing. No, it didn't. No, it did not go a minute. It didn't go five minutes. All right. But Sting came out, they did a crisscross spot, and then he started putting him in holds. Maybe it was two minutes then. Still, I don't want to see this Sting. I, I agree. And we, I don't want to hear this Sting. He's in the big main event tomorrow. He sure is. For the record, by the way, Ron won with a flying shoulder pump. Yeah, and in that match, mm. another insufferably long, boring match. That was much more boring. And the announcers are talking about, someday, this Ron Simmons may be a future world champion. And I was like, when this match was over... Fuck off. I do not want to see this guy as a world champion. So Sting wins, and he goes to cut a promo, or actually he goes to be interviewed, and Ross asks him a question. Sting's got nothing to say. I mean, he's silent. I thought he was blown up at first. So Ross repeats his question, and Sting says, I heard you. And he can't collect his thoughts. He's traumatized by what has happened to his friends Magnum T and Dusty Rhodes. He's very concerned about what's going to happen to them. He knows he has his, the most important match of his career tomorrow, but at this point, he doesn't care. He doesn't want to talk anymore. This interview's over. Boring! That was the go-home promo, Sting Cut, for the Clash of the Champions. A highlight on this show. J.J. Dillon returns. Oh, man. He's very disheveled, but he has, time, has had time to collect himself, collect his thoughts, and he's got a lot to say. You know, he says he once felt bad for what happened to Magnum T.A., a proud athlete whose career was ruined by a terrible accident. It was nobody's fault. But no matter how bad he felt for him, he was not going to tolerate Magnum interfering in the horseman matches. And he knew when Magnum was doing commentary, he knew Magnum's pride would get the best of him. He'd have to stick his nose in where he didn't belong. So he and Tully had come out to warn him on the show, to warn Magnum to stay out of their business. And then, a three-time World Heavyweight Champion, the reigning U.S. Champion, on national TV, attacked the reigning World Tag Team Champion with a baseball bat. But for the whole world! Everyone saw it! And then, in all the carnage, the head of the National Wrestling Alliance was struck a blow by the same man. J.J. said, if you get a copy of this videotape, he would promise it would be hand-delivered to every member of the NWA Board of Directors. Stop right there. He says, I'm going to send this video to everyone in the NWA. The fans began to cheer. 
He says, I am going to demand Dusty Rhodes be barred from wrestling for the rest of his life. The rest of his life. And the fans started to clap and cheer. Didn't catch that, but you... Yeah, that was the most important part of this whole interview. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I could. <laughs> They're turning on Dusty hardcore, but when he mentioned all these things he's going to do and everyone starts clapping and cheering, I was just like, wow. Because then there was part of me that thought, maybe someone's coming out. That's what they're cheering for. Mm. You know who came out next? Jim Cornette. Yeah. They were not cheering for him. They were cheering for him to be banned from wrestling for life. Yeah. So JJ starts to leave. And Tony says, cuts him off. Won't let him leave. He says, I have to say, Tully Blanchard instigated this. JJ says, that's beside the point. And Tony says, well, let's go ahead and look at this again. And JJ says, great. I want you to show it as many times as you can. I want everyone to see this. Yep. And they replayed the whole entire deal. And they go to commercial, and they come back, and Jim Cornette's there. And he's very, very sad. Oh, he's weeping. Tears. He barely. Jim Cornette can barely form a complete sentence. Yes. Think about that. His he's, close personal friend, Jim Crockett Sr., has been attacked. Junior. Junior. There'd be news if Jim Crockett Sr. was attacked. He all. mentions close personal friend. Everybody laughs. Hackles. He's going on, Cornet is, about how D Dusty had tried to assassinate Tully he Blanchard. What he did was appalling. He used a deadly weapon. He attempted to assassinate Tully Blanchard and then took that deadly weapon to Jim Crockett Jr. He should be fined, suspended, imprisoned, or electrocuted. Yes. It was amazing. It was amazing. So for all of you that don't know where this is going, and just to cut to the end of the show here very quickly... The end of the show, David Crockett comes out, and he's outraged about what happened to his brother. He says they will not stand for this. He demands the fan to watch the footage uh, for the third time on this show. By the end of the, yes. They weren't messing around. No. And then he says, fans, we want to know who you think was responsible. Tully, Magnum, or Dusty Rhodes? Then they go to the end of the show. Mm -hmm. So anyway... Dusty's out of here. Dusty gets banned. The Midnight Rider's coming. Who? Exactly. Yeah. And in addition to the Midnight Rider coming in, you'll never guess who gets stripped of the title and does not have to lose it in the well, ring. Well, if Dusty Rhodes is banned, he can't Dusty champion. Dusty Rhodes. Yes. Man, oh, man. So back to this Cornet promo. For like a minute or two, and he's obviously being over the top and making a joke out of the whole thing. But he's choking back tears. Eyes are watering. He's, you know, shaking. Talking about Dusty Rhodes and his close personal friend, Jim Crockett Jr. And he just kind of stops and says, But enough about that. Here comes the Midnight Express! And he's all hey! happy. Like, they flip a switch, he's happy again. So it's the Midnight Express versus Big Bear Collie and Bear, uh, Kendall Windham. Yeah, Big Bear Collie. You missed him last week. I did miss the debut of Big Bear, Big like Bear a, Collie and Al Perez debuted in the same show. He's and a, the Fantastics. Fat Scott Norton is what he is. He, he very much looks like a poor man Scott Norton. He's not that fat. We've seen way fatter jobbers on here, but Cornette's ripping him apart and just calls him Big Fat Collie. Yeah, which oh, is a, terrible. Hey, it's a much better name than Big Bear Collie. Oh, come on. Big Bear Collie? I didn't say more He's accurate. a dog and a bear. He's a big, big fat collie. So he they're outraged. The Minute Expressman stealing their moves. They're going to stop to all that tomorrow. Oh, yeah. This whole feud, Vinny. Mm -hmm. The irony of this. Jim Cornette is managing the team that does the most moves. Mm -hmm. That's all he's talking about for this whole thing. They do the most moves. They do more moves better than most people have moves. Sure. I'm thinking this is the guy that cuts so many promos on the fucking Young Bucks. <laughs> yes. Everybody else. Amazing this how that works. This was his fucking team in 1988. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the Midnight's one with a rocket launcher. I still can't believe. Like, the, the, the Dusty Rhodes baseball bat attack is no longer the biggest news in this show, as far as I'm concerned. We're not making any of this up. <laughs> he put on TV, national TV, on a Saturday afternoon. Now, I know there was the, 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 there's not as much, much cable networks as, the, as there is now, but Saturday afternoon in, in, in well, it's March, there was no football, but they got to compete with baseball, they got to compete with basketball, hockey, uh, the outdoors, everything Vinny, you got to compete with. This is not the way, this is not how it is today. 
The fans were going to watch this goddamn show from beginning to end. They would not miss their Rastlin show. They're not missing the big green machine versus El Negro. He's not making that up, everyone. A masked man in all green <laughs> mm-hmm. and another masked man in red. In red. Yes. Masked jobber versus masked jobber. Well, kind of. Hmm? Because Tony explains to us, this is an exact quote, we have been hearing a lot about the big green machine lately. Have we? And I thought, please tell me more. <laughs> and he proceeds to not tell me no. anymore. I'm like, what can you tell me about the big green machine? We know nothing. So these masked fellas clubber each other for a while. Jim Ross clearly loved to say the words <laughs> big green machine. <laughs> The, 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 the bile in his voice. Yes. Disgust for big green machine. Allow Who, by the me. Way, was not nearly as big as El Negro. No, allow me to explain this finish. Before you do, I want to explain the setup for the finish. Yes. So, El Negro made what I believe was a babyface comeback. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure he was making a babyface comeback. And he lays big green machine out and he runs, bounces off the ropes. He's going to do a big splash. The big green machine rolls out of the way. And El Negro, who is now airborne, rather than break his fall with his knees or his hands or his gut or his chest or his gut, El Negro, a 300 pound man, jumps in the air and comes down and breaks his fall with his own forehead and shoulder. <laughs> I, yeah. la- I cackled and howled and laughed. I've never laughed so hard before in my life until he's down. The big green machine stands up over his fallen body. He raises his arm in the air, and he drops a big elbow. And he gets up. And he drops a big elbow. And he gets up. And he drops a big elbow. And he drops a big elbow. Drops a big elbow. Drops a big elbow. Drops a big elbow. elbow, Pins him. Seven. (laughs) His finish. Seven consecutive elbow drops. Was his finish. Was the finish of the big green machine. Was it Dolph Ziggler? (laughs) Remember he used to do that? Yes. Yeah, Until he accidentally killed Jerry Lawler. Jerry Lawler still believes it causes heart attack. Yes. But yes. And he never did it again, by well, the way. Well, clearly it's a very dangerous finish. It's a very dangerous finish. How, have we confirmed El Negro still alive? I don't know. I don't know who it was. Maybe Big Green Machine killed him with seven elbow drops. Seven straight elbows. And so, boy, by the seventh elbow, he was not getting up very fast. <laughs> between, between the splash onto the forehead and the seven elbow drops for the win. It was worth it. Perfect comedy. Yes. <laughs> this could not have been any funnier. Uh, yeah, this match was either five stars or minus five stars and nothing in between. I mean, you could give it zero stars. No! Because <laughs> that's right in between, actually. No, you cannot give it zero stars. Okay. It's either an all-time terrible match or an all-time great one. I'm just not sure which. Gary Hart and Al Perez come out for a promo. This <laughs> second week in a row, Gary Hart is referred to him as Virgil. Virgil Runnels. Yes. He says, this is the violent side Dusty Rhodes has always tried to hide. I have known Dusty Rhodes to grab crowbars and clean out an entire bar, smashing, smashing out brains. Virgil Reynolds is a violent man. So it's Al's turn to talk. First of all, the women all love him because he's a pretty man. He's not the most charismatic guy you ever saw. And then in the middle of his talking, he's got to say something to Gary. So he turns his back to the hard camera and just keeps on talking in his soft-spoken voice. They tried desperately to cut to a side shot to get some part of his face on camera, but they still can't do that. He just said Dusty was a scary man. Yeah. And that was it. He was not good at being on TV. No. Jimmy Garvin and Shane Douglas versus Mike Jackson and Art Pritz. Long and boring. Yeah. I said Santana was teaming with, or excuse me, Shane Douglas would team with Ricky Santana in the Crockett Cup, so why are they not teaming on this show? I, I don't know. Not that I really want to. I don't to, want to see that. I don't want to see it. That's that. So, went on for a long time, and Jimmy Garvin won with a brain buster. Yeah. And then David Crockett came out, and he's, that's the best way to put it, like, infuriated. Well, kind of, but he also knew his brother was tough, and he would bounce back from this. So... He said J.J. was right about one thing. They could not tolerate what had happened. They could not tolerate what Tully Blanchard had done either. And he gave the speech about, you watch this yourself, fans. You do. 
and there will be gorilla shit all over the army. Wait, let's get going. So yeah, we watched NWA Clash of the Champions 1, March 27th, 1988. And they did not waste time. They jumped right into action with Mike Rotunda versus Jimmy Garvin in an amateur rules match for the TV title. That's right. What was the build for this, by the way? I oh, don't there was think... none. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, Garvin has been talking about Rotunda for a while, but there was no mention of an amateur rules match. I don't think there was even a mention of a TV title match on this show. No, there was. There was a. There was a. Uh, or no, that was the. What are the, the pug- standby matches? Was for the uh, Western States Heritage Title. Right, right. But I mean, I mean, on a, on on the Saturday night shows we've been watching. I don't think they mentioned this one time, let alone the stips. I feel like, man, maybe you're right. I feel like I they announced be- the match, but not these goofy stips. I could be wrong. I definitely remember, remember them plugging the Prince of Darkness match at the Crockett Cup. That's right, which we Crockett never saw. Well, it hasn't happened yet. That's true, yeah. Was it, wasn't that one of the standby matches? What the hell was the standby match? They mentioned two of them. Uh, Ricky Santana and uh, Larry Zbysko. Yep. And Shane Douglas and somebody. It was Shane Douglas and... Or maybe, uh, Shane, maybe Shane and Zbysko. Yeah, Shane and Zbysko. It was definitely Shane Douglas and Ricky Santana, because I remember thinking, even though I know the main event goes 45 minutes, please don't let it go any less than that. Yes, it was Shane Douglas and Larry Zbysko for the Western States Heritage title. That was the other standby match. Yeah. So, before we talk about the match, real quick, we have been watching the Saturday Night Studio shows, and uh, last week, I believe, we watched the Randy Savage, Ted DiBiase final at WrestleMania. Having watched both those shows, my God, was the production on this show terrible. Yeah, it was terrible, but the wrestling was a thousand times better. Well, of, of course, of course, but the, the, the picture's blurry, it's dark, the heat was great. I'm yeah, wondering if maybe the reason that the picture was blurry was like the tape that they used to make the digital copy for the network and not that that's actually what it looked like on television. The lighting, that's another story entirely. Yeah. But I'm wondering if maybe it was just a really, really bad tape that they used. Maybe. Stranger Which, by the way, I went to, I went to, you've been here to the beach. Sure have. So upstairs here in the studio, I had no TV or anything, so I'd watch all the shows on the iPad. And then this weekend, I just thought, you know what? Why don't I just buy a damn TV and an Apple TV for upstairs? And I can just watch everything like I do at home because your Apple TV sinks. So it's 2018, which means I could get an Apple TV, a really good Apple TV, and a very, very nice high-def LED 32-inch TV and the cables and everything for like $350. Sure. So I did it. Yeah. And so I hook everything up and I sit down. I'm like, God damn, living the life, living the life here. Look at this. I got my own TV up here. Turn on the Clash of Champions and it looks like shit. It's so bad. I was like, fuck, I spent all that money on this fucking TV and the TV sucks. It's all pissed off. Then later I watched something else and realized, no, it was the tape. TV's just fine. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, this here amateur rules match. That means three five minute rounds. And just a one count is necessary for a pin. So with those steps, with that setup, with the varsity club being there, and Mike Rotunda, a legit collegiate wrestler, they went in there and did every pro wrestling match you ever saw. The only difference was, like, Rotunda would get body slammed or take a tackle, and he would immediately roll outside so as not to be at risk of being pinned with a one count. That's right. Now, the rules were not only was it one count, but there were three five-minute rounds. So you'd go five minutes, and then the time limit would expire, and there would be a break. A 30-second rest period. Yes, and I thought, oh, fuck, rounds. They always suck. Like, you know, just, I mean, one counts. It's just one of those things where they could have a good match. Why are you muddying it up with these stupid stipulations that are going to make it worse? Lo and behold, they had a great match, and the fans went crazy for this goofy match. They're going crazy for their amateur wrestling. They're going crazy as they go for pins. Mm-hmm. They just went nuts for this. So they did go crazy. That is true. But it was every pro wrestling match you ever saw. There was hair pulls. There was tight pulls. There was cheap shots. Uh, pu- closed fist punches. I think my favorite part of this match, actually, is Rotunda pushes it back into the corner. And the ref calls for a clean break. And Rotunda teases it. But then he balls up his fists. So Garvin balls up his fists. And then Rotunda complains. Yeah, he's a great heel. What a dick. So it was a little weird. Round one ends, 
And after getting his ass kicked for like four and a half minutes, Rotunda takes over. And the last 15, 20 seconds is Rotunda riding Garvin, trying to turn him over, and Garvin just trying to hang on and stay on his belly. And he succeeds, and the bell rings. Then Rotunda roughs him up a little bit in the rest period because he's an asshole. So Rotunda in a match where you only need a one count to win takes Garvin off his feet and then immediately goes to the top rope in round two. What, a, what an idiot. He gets slammed off. Garvin hooks him for the brain buster. And then all hell breaks loose. Kevin Sullivan jumps in the apron. Precious grabs him. He grabs her back. Garvin grabs Sullivan. This lets Rotunda's schoolboy Garvin, and I think he hooked the trunks, and he gets the one count and the win. I just love that you only have to pin the guy for one second. A one count. And he still grabbed the pins off a of distraction, or grabbed the, the trunks off a of distraction. The funny thing was, all these guys have been doing pro wrestling for years. Who knows how many thousands of matches they've all had. And the ref counts one, and he stops, and for a moment, no one knows what to do. Yes. <laughs> well, that's it. <laughs> that's the end. So, the varsity club swarms Garvin. Rick Steiner is out there beating his ass, along with Rotunda and, S- and Sullivan. And who should make the save but Precious herself? She picks up that 2 by 4 She whacks Steiner with it. She grabs the coat hanger. She is on Sullivan's back trying to choke him to death. This is not a helpless damsel in distress. No, and the fans this... were going batshit crazy for her yes. going crazy. Think about this, everybody. If you have been watching the Retro Nitros, where Rick Steiner goes out there and he roughs up grown men and he beats the hell out of them and he sometimes kind of sort of shoots on them, but then he gives them a high spot or whatever. This Rick Steiner from 1988 was just as scary, just in a little bit different way. Like, he, he wouldn't rough people up and he was younger and he was in better shape, but he was still a really scary dude. Precious gets this 2 by 4 and she whacks him in the back, and he just goes flying. I howled at the bump this guy took for her 2 by 4 shot to the back. Yes. And finally, the three evil men start to get to their feet, and they start to grab Precious, but Garvin drags her out of the ring and gets her safely to the back. This is awesome. It was awesome. The, the crowd. Precious is not just going to stand by her man. She's going to fight by him if she has to. That's right. It was a great match. Mm-hmm. It was a great post-match angle. Jim Ross on this show was so good. Remember when I said that Mauro Ranallo was like the greatest commentator you ever heard on the NXT show when he was calling the main event on Wednesday? I do. And I said, you know, some people will probably not like him because he's like going so crazy for it. Mauro Ranallo would have said the same thing about Jim Ross. Jim Ross, especially during the main event of the show and during the, the tag title change, he was going completely bonkers. Yes. Like, Mauro Ranallo has never been this excited about anything in his life, as Jim Ross was going crazy for this stuff. But at the same time, he's still making solid points with rational analysis of the sporting event that's unfolding Yeah, he wasn't a gimmick. He was there just was a- really excited about what was going on. We'll skip ahead to the main event here. There's a spot in the main event where they're on the floor, and Sting charges, and Fair dodges, and Sting hits the post. And Ross talks about how this is a, uh, I don't know if he said rookie mistake, but an inexperience because there's a high risk with low reward. If it misses and it did, he's wiped out. If he, even if he had hit the move, you're still outside the ring and you can't win out there. This, this is a move with high risk and very little reward, a poor decision by the youngster. I thought, God damn, he's right. So, yeah, Jim Ross was out of those, uh, unbelievably great on this show. Bob Cottle interviewed Steve Williams. We've not been seen in several months on this program, or any other program. Uh, he says he's been on a successful tour of Japan. First, they asked him about Dusty Rhodes' baseball attack on Tully Blanchard, which had been the day before, you will recall. Steve says Magnum and Dusty are his friends. Well, he doesn't have anything else to say about that subject. He, he begins ho- when he's talking about Dusty by saying, and I quote, Dusty, go on with your bad self. <laughs> he did say that. That's what he said. Yes. Uh, He says uh, he hopes Sting beats Flair tonight, but he has a contract to face the winner regardless. And then at this point, he just started to ramble. And I mean ramble. This promo sucked, dude. Like, I don't want to hear anything positive about it, except for the line about go on with your bad self. Even the stuff that he said before he started rambling, 
he still was marble mouthed, yeah, and 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 searching for his words and tr- trying to find a point. It got the second half was even worse. The word, he's just rambling on about Flair, but saying nothing. And then he halfway saved it. at the very end. He waves at the camera and says, "Bye bye, take care," and he leaves. Hideous, Doctor Death, everyone. Now the uh, other notable thing here is there was zero mention of the UWF title, so presumably that is just mothballed by now, never to be seen again. Fantastics versus Midnight Express for the U.S. tag titles. Just an insane, barely in control brawl from start to finish. Yeah, I was expecting a a wrestling match. I was I was wrong. Mm-hmm. We got a wrestling match with Lex Luger, with the Midnight Express and Fantastics. We got a wild, out of control. I don't want to call it a smoke and mirrors match, but I mean, if you were going to do a smoke and mirrors tag match, this is what you would do. Yes, yeah, so they 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 brawled everywhere. They were in the ring. They were out of the ring. They were using chairs. They were using rackets. They they laid a table out on the floor. They didn't set it up. It, was, it wasn't like unfolded. They just laid the table on the floor and did stuff on the table, which apparently is even worse than just doing it on the cement that was underneath the table. But it worked because when they start body slamming Tommy Rogers and bulldogging Tommy Rogers onto this table, the women are horrified. They're beside themselves at what's going to happen to these pretty young men. So they're fighting and they're fighting and they're fighting. I like the spot where the <laughs> the the cornet's outside and it, it, the table's one of those skinny tables that he used in Japan a lot. And he, he holds the table up against the ropes and they whip Tommy into it. That was a spot. So they're beating him and they're beating him and they're beating him. And there's false tags. And he's doing like, so good selling that he uh, is blown dude, up. Like, dude, he sells like he can barely get to his feet. He can barely wait, breathe. He's not just been beaten, but he's exhausted. Yeah. They, the, the, the Express is a spot where there's, it, it's a simple spot. Whip a guy in, do a drop toe hold. The other dude drops the elbow. He can barely run the ropes. Oh, he's, he's done. Just, he is on his last legs. And they are, they are manhandling him through the spot because they want to do a drop toe hold or an elbow, damn it. And then they're cheating like mad, and Fulton has the ref, and Cornette's in the ring, and Tommy's being triple teamed, and Bobby Fulton can take no more. And he grabs that referee, he throws him out of the ring, and he just runs wild. Now before that, here's the big spot. So Rogers fires up, and he finally makes this hot tag, and the place goes absolutely nuts. But the ref was distracted. And so the ref says, no, 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 that was not a legal tag. The fans are furious because this was completely a legal tag. And more so, Jim Ross is furious. And we have mentioned this a million times dating back to the 90s because particularly in WWE, the commentary is so abysmal on the main roster, especially that period where Michael Cole was a heel. You must, you must have announcers with credibility. You must have announcers that you like, you find them to be personable. It doesn't have to be both of them. You can have a heel color commentator. But your main lead announcer needs to be somebody that you like and that you believe. And trust. And, and trust. And he does not he does not feed you a load of bullshit. No. If it's just like Jim Ross when he always used that bowling shoe ugly line. If the match sucks, he is going to in some professional way let you know that he knows that this sucks. Therefore, because he has that credibility, when something like this happens and a babyface makes a hot tag and the referee doesn't see it and the announcer absolutely loses his mind with outrage, you, the viewer, lose your mind with outrage. That's the whole point of a lead announcer. Lead announcers today just spout a bunch of bullshit from the back and they make shit up and you don't believe a word they say. Then they try and sell you stuff, and you just don't like it, and you hate them, and you think it's stupid. This was so good, this hot tag, that the referee didn't see. It was so good. It was the key to the entire match. And then, yes, Fulton lost his mind and threw the referee over the top, and the rest is history. So as he's running wild, there's still one of him and three of them. And Bobby Eaton grabs his arms, and Cornette goes to hit him with a racket, and Fulton dodges... And I thought to myself, oh, my God, Jim Cornette hit Bobby Eaton really hard in the face. And I went back and watched it. And what actually happened was Jim Cornette hit Bobby Eaton pretty hard in the shoulder. And then Eaton grabbed his nose. I was worked. It's you the whole worked. point. 
That's the point of wrestling. It's supposed wrestling. to be a magic show. It's fake. Exactly. It's a magic show. So the Fantastics run wild. They hit the rocket launcher. A second ref runs in, and he counts three. But then, of course, if you've ever watched any show really from this era, you know the first ref came to and said, wait a minute, this guy did throw me over the top rope. That is illegal. I'm disqualifying them. So the Midnight Express win, but they're not satisfied with this. They continue the attack, and they hold uh, Fulton over the ropes and take turns whipping him with Jim Cornette's belt. And Cornette gets his own licks in, too. And finally, Rogers chases them away with a chair. And as the heels are all leaving, the segment's over. They've, they, they, they've, they've entertained the crowd and built up for, for whatever they have next in their future. And Jim Cornette has to hit the ref with his racket one more time just to be an asshole. Yep. <laughs> just awesome. awesome and awesome. what what is the point of all of this here? Once again, this finish was outstanding in a vacuum. In a company where, over the last two years, they've done one Bullshit, dusty finish after another. It's it's too many. Yeah, they've overdone the finish. Yes, and I, I'm presuming this will lead to a series of strap matches, or at least a gimmick where if the Fantastics win, they get to whip Cornette, something along those lines. But nothing here happens for no reason. So <laughs> they are in the in the background. They are wrapping barbed wire around pro wrestling ropes. Yes as men are about to be slaughtered for our amusement. And in the front of all this carnage, there's nice, friendly Southern gentleman Bob Cottle, who first draws attention to it. There you go, folks. They're tying barbed wire around those ropes. And then he throws it to a segment where Eddie Haskell yes. gets to meet Jim Cornette. Now, there's probably a lot of youngsters out there who out don't, legitimately don't know who Eddie Haskell is. Which is astounding, but it's true. There was once a show called Leave It to Beaver in like the 50s and 60s. 50s. And it wasn't really the 50s? Yeah, well. Yes. And then they tried to bring it back in the 80s with the same characters all grown up, and you can imagine how well that lasted. But Eddie Haskell was the older brother's friend who was sleazy and untrustworthy and uh, phony and insincere. And he'd always butter up to the, 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 the family. He was so, made for this business. He really was, honestly. So... He was Jim Cornette. Yeah. He introduces himself. Whatever, I, I, I didn't bother writing down the actor's name. It doesn't matter. He never did anything else. He's Eddie Haskell. He introduces himself as an actor and says, I'm Eddie Haskell from the new Leave it to Beaver. And then just he's just Eddie Haskell from that point forward. He's very excited to meet Jim Cornette, and you've never seen two bigger weasels just sucker up to each other. They can't stop telling each other how great they are, the great TV shows they make, the great men they manage. Of course, they both want Mama Cornette's money. They want to make sure that that uh, they, they are there to exploit her cash while she's there and also there to, 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 to be her favorite when she's no longer there. And they talk about the great times they're going to have playing tennis and taking the blender out to the jacuzzi for some beverages. And they're just the best chums. And they leave. Yeah, so... Leave it to Beaver was like a super popular show. And just legendary characters, Ward Cleaver, Beaver, Eddie Haskell. And the problem was it was such a great show that everybody involved with the show were completely typecast by who they played. Sure. And so like a lot of them had a really hard time getting work afterwards. And I guess I think they were shooting the new Leave it to Beaver at the time that they were using Eddie Haskell here. Of course. So, I mean, he was busy. And, and it was on TBS. Sure. So he was busy. But, like, the point was, why the fuck didn't he just go into wrestling? <laughs> he was not doing... <laughs> it wasn't like he was The Rock. You know what I mean? Yeah. He was a guy struggling to have a career. And he was so good at this. He would have been such a great heel manager. This was followed by Bob Cottle interviewing Gary Hart and Al Perez. Oh, they were not as good God. as Eddie Haskell. Holy shit. Gary Hart is not like one of the greatest promos. I hope, hopefully Court Bauer doesn't hear this because he's a huge fan. But and, like the, the hierarchy of, of fantastic manager promos, like he's not up there at the very top. No, he's good. But he's a good promo. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it is they really gave him the guys who could not talk. <laughs> and I guess we don't really hear a lot of, of Bobby, uh, Bobby Eaton, for example, but man... Al Perez got to cut a promo this week. He was 
horrible. Yeah. I, I can't even think of, he looked good. That's the nicest thing that I can say. Why did, they, why did they ever let him say one word? They should have That's pretended a, he was a mute. That was a great question. Like, we know the Midnight Express can talk, but they never do. Stan cut that one promo on his first show in. Oh, I think that was it. It was awesome. But Al Perez is out here, and he's talking about Dusty's baseball bat, and Al is more wooden than the bat. And then he has some line about how you better bring another baseball bat. Only a baseball bat can beat me. Or a gale storm. <laughs> Fucking gale storm. Ridiculous. Now, that being said, I think Al Perez is... He may be The Rock compared to Francis Crockett. Oh, my Lord. How? Where was family... Gary Hart to <laughs> like do her promo? How could a family... The whole family business is pro wrestling and had been for a long, 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 long time. How is it possible that the only one with any kind of on-screen presence is David? Well, they were supposed to be behind the scenes. They sure were. Not like later where you also became the show. I guess so. So Francis Crockett is there to reveal the top ten seeds for the Crockett Cup. She just absolutely blows through this as fast as she can. Thank you. Oh my god. I had to end. rewind it six times to get these these ten teams. Well, I hope I hope you felt dumb when they put a graphic up at the end after you could just hit pause that once. Well the thing was I had to go back because every time she said a name, they would put the words up briefly, but then immediately take it back down because she was rattling through them so fast. Yes. So I was like, fuck, I just got to go back and get all these. So, for those of you who are writing this down, the top 10 seeds in the Crockett Cup tournament from 10 to 1, number 10, Ivan Koloff and Dick Murdoch. Oh, you ruined the joke. I thought you were just going to read them as fast as you could. I would not try to imitate her speed nor her complete lack of humanity. I guess I can try. I can't talk fast. All right, hang on. All right, I'll do it. Then you can do the real ones, okay? All right. The top 10... Oh, sorry. I'll try again. The top 10 seeds for the Crockett Cup are Ivan Koloff and Dick Murdoch, Sting and Run Garvin, Varsity Club, number 7, The Fantastics, number 6, Barry Windham and Lex Luger, number 5, The Powers of Pain, number 4, Midnight Express, number 3, Road Warriors, number 2, Nikita Koloff and Dusty Rhodes, number 1, Anderson, and Burble Dodge. I <laughs> fucked up almost, the end. You almost got it. <laughs> I almost got it. I don't think Anderson and Bubble <laughs> She might have said that for all I know. I was asleep. I fell asleep twice during this top ten. So that was the top ten seeds. And uh, she, by the way, looked so bored and sounded so bored talking about Give everybody the real top ten. We don't have graphics here. Number ten. I feel like I I should do it like you did. Ivan Koloff and Dick Murdoch. Number nine, Sting and Ron Garvin. Which, by the way, what the hell? Sting and Ron Garvin? I know. Number eight, the Varsity Club. Number seven, the Fantastics. Number six, Wyndham and Luger. Number five, The Powers of Pain. Number four, The Midnight Express. Number three, The Road Warriors. Number two, The Superpowers. And number one, Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson. Man, oh man. What a lineup. What? A, can't wait to see these ten seeds face off in the tournament. Spoiler, by the way, at least two of those teams do not actually compete in the tournament. <laughs> we'll get to it. Road Warriors and Dusty Rhodes versus Powers of Pain and Ivan Koloff in, and I quote, a Chicago street fight, and then in parentheses, six-man Texas barbed wire. Yeah. So Chicago street fight with Texas barbed wire in North Carolina. Yeah, basically. So the baby faces run out there. You, you, you can't go through the ropes, obviously, but you can very easily go under them. And they run out there, and they slide into the ring, and they're raring to go. They can't wait. They go to commercial, and they come back, and Paul Jones and his crew are out there, and they are not down with this barbed wire bullshit. They're stomping towards the ring and stepping back. They're kind of testing the wire and pricking their fingers. They're not happy about it. And after like a minute of this, finally they got to get in the ring, and Ivan slides in, and he sells being pricked on the barbed wire, just sliding into the ring. And there's just a big brawl. There's six dudes in the ring, sometimes going out of the ring to do stuff. It's basically a mini battle royal. It's like five and it was, minutes, and it was boring. Yeah, they 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 tease going into the barbed wire, and then Ivan and Dusty actually did go into the barbed wire. Dusty hits a horrible DDT at one point. I don't. I think he. I think it was hard to tell because there were so many guys in the ring. I think he grabbed this guy for a DDT, and like halfway through, gave up and just dropped to both knees. So, somewhere in this melee, Animal hits a power slam on the Warlord, and goes to make a cover. 
The barbarian goes to the top rope and tries to headbutt Animal. Animal dodges. Barbarian headbutts the warlord. Animal covers the warlord. The referee slides into the ring, and he counts three, and that's the end. So Animal's mask, the brawl continues, of course. Animal's mask comes off, and they show this replay, and he so badly wanted to have it set up that he would get kicked and throw his head up, and the mask would go flying, and it didn't quite work that way. But they tear his mask off. They go for his eyeball. They're trying to blind the man. And finally, Hawk makes a save with a chain, and that's it. Could have done without that one. Nikita Koloff and his hair cut a promo. Yeah, they call it a new look, a Nikita new look, Koloff. He says, I am a new generation Russian, just like uh, Mikhail Gorbachev has brought Glasnost and Perestroika to the Soviet Union. I have brought it to wrestling. I have been talking about this, he says, and he holds up a sign so that we, the viewers at home, cannot see it. And he shows it to Cottle, and Cottle like, tries to turn it towards the camera. And there's a sign reading, get high on sports, not drugs. Yes, the old say no to drugs campaign. It was 1988, you recall. So Nikita talks about seeing somebody close to him fighting for their life. And his wife was, in fact, fighting cancer at the time. When Kevin Sullivan or Dick Murdoch, one of these assholes, tried to take his life away, he became a fighter. He said, you know, I've held many titles in this sport, but I've never been the world champion. I want to face the world champion, whether it be Ric Flair, whether it be Sting, whether it be Dusty Rhodes, whether it be all these different people. It says... He asked him about the baseball bat attack, and he says it was very wrong what I saw. It was very wrong for Tully Blanchard to attack Magnum T.A. And he says he and Dusty would defend their Crockett Cup championship with pride. Yeah, he mentioned Kevin Sullivan after the Say No to Drugs campaign. So my story that Sullivan told, he drugged these two fine young college athletes. That's why they were all fucked up and part of the Varsity Club. Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson versus Barry Windham and Lex Luger for the World Tag Team titles. What a fucking unbelievably great match. It was. It was It was so good. And at the same time, and it, they started with the finish. In, in two minutes, the first two minutes of this match, we had Lex Luger doing a torture rack. They cut him off for the heat, and he got a hot tag. Yeah, I was watching this match, and it was just all action. They're going nuts. And I thought, did I miss the first ten minutes of this? No, they're just going crazy, and all of a sudden you hear the timekeeper give the five minute call yeah <laughs> i was like what at first i thought it meant five minutes left but no it was five minutes in they'd done all of this crazy stuff but it kept it got better seriously with it within at the five minutes call we had seen all those things i already said then they cut off windham and Arn got his ddt and spine buster in the only move in this match barry hit a lariat at some point the only finish in this match that took longer than five minutes to hit was uh tully's slingshot suplex which he eventually got in there so there's the heat on Barry. He kicks out, he kicks out of the slingshot suplex, which nobody ever did. Oh, my God. Before we even get to that, first off, Luger was really good in this match. Barry Windham was unbelievable in this match. Like, we watch all of this TV, and every now and then you see a longer Barry Windham match. Every, every now and then you see a match where he's in an arena or something like that. And how he's watching, and I think, he's good, but, like, I don't get it. I don't get why they wanted him to be the guy. He's like a really good, tall, good-looking baby face, but he's not hes not great. Then I watched this match, and it was everything that everybody said that he was and that they wanted him to be. He's just working his ass off. He's running. He's bumping. He's selling. The place is just going crazy he's for him. selling. I know we talked about Tommy Rogers earlier, but... As Wyndham, he's he's doing these host spots. He's throwing out punches and whatever, and then he'll just like he'll stand up tall and then just lean and teeter and then collapse. Yes, so dramatic. The best babyface of all time here in this match. So yes, Tully hoists him up. He hits the slingshot suplex, which is Tully's finisher. He hits the move. He does not go immediately to a cover. Instead. Tully gets on his knees, and he thrusts both fists in the air, and he celebrates that he's hit his move. He goes for the cover, and Wyndham kicks out. The most incredible near fall. The place, it was a totally modern near fall. The place goes absolutely crazy for it. Wyndham responds by standing straight up in the air, and he walks, and he stumbles, and he makes the tag. It was so awesome. 
his celebra- totally celebration for this uh, for this thing shot suplex, like he like he had already won, and then he makes the cover. And I've been watching you know modern wrestling for however long you want to call modern wrestling modern, and I was certain certain that Lex was going to hit the ring and break up this pin. No, Barry just kicked out. He did, and he man, ha- Tully, you got to imagine Tully's a man of God. Okay, imagine that Tully is standing before the pearly gates and he is going to be given the thumbs up or the thumbs down and the big hand comes out from the gates with that big thumbs up the celebration that Tully threw here was a celebration he would throw for that thumbs up you've never seen a man so excited and then it was thwarted and then he was thwarted failed so Barry falls over, but tags Lex as he's falling. Lex runs wild. He's just a unbelievable Greek god in there. He is Superman throwing these civilians around, just destroying them. It breaks down into a four-way. JJ hops in the apron. He holds a chair in the corner. He wants Arn to throw Lex into the chair. But, oh, cruel irony, Lex reverses it. Arn goes into the chair. The chair goes down. JJ's beside himself. Can't believe he fucked this up. Lex covers Arn. The ref counts three. The building explodes. And Lex Luger, in the most athletic moment of his entire career, gets to his feet and jumps 87 feet into the air. (laughs) He jumped so high. Jesus Christ. Oh, it was so great. It was so great to see baby faces vanquish heels and all the fans who paid their money to go to this event were over the moon with joy. There was no dusty finish. No. There was no screw job. There was no bullshit. The good guys won. Good guys, good triumphed over evil. Oh, it was great. And evil was unmistakably evil. God, it was great. This was one of my favorite matches I've seen so far in 2018. Yeah. They introduced the judges for the main event. So, And boy, did they do a bad job of it. They did, well, yeah, yes, everything about the judges sucked from start to finish. First of all, well, we'll get to the end. Well, let me, are, let me start with before you get to the judges. They announce it is Ric Flair versus Sting. There is a 45-minute time limit. There must be a winner. I'm sorry, did you say there there must be a winner? let me repeat myself. There must be a winner. Now, how are we going to ensure that there is a winner? Well, they've got some judges. Mm -hmm. Now, there are five people at ringside. They announce Gary Chester, Sandy Scott, Patty Mullen, Eddie Haskell, and Jason Hervey. Yes. Okay. Now, to cut to the chase, I won't say who voted for who yet, but I will say that at the end of the match, we realized that Eddie Haskell and Jason Hervey were just out there for the fun of it. They did not get to vote. They're not actually judges. No. Okay. So now, you have Gary Juster. NWA Board of Directors. NWA Board of Directors. Mm-hmm. You have Sandy Scott. Long-time wrestling star. Yes. And you have Patty Mullen. Pet of the year. Okay. It's not, Vinny, just that she's the pet of the year. No, it is not. Because we we discussed her prior appearance on the show. The night before, on (laughs) television, she's out there for the evening of her lifetime with the nature boy Ric Flair. Yes. On television. Who the fuck assigned her a judge for a match involving the nature boy, Ric Flair? I question her ability to stay unbiased. Okay. I suspect she may have uh, uh, some, 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 a, a preference. In, yes. In this match. So those are the judges, everybody. Yes. There must be a winner. There must be a winner. So a Sting versus Ric Flair for the NWA World Heavyweight title. Also... I don't recall them ever mentioning this on TV, but J.J. Dillon is hanging in a cage above the ring. Yes, they put him in the old shark cage, and he's actually, he, they actually, they were they were smart. He was hung above the arena, away from the ring. 
Right. So he couldn't just drop a gimmick into the ring like every other stupid shark cage match there's ever been. Yes, yes. So everything up to this point in the show had been rushed. Garvin and Rotunda was a fast match. The Fantastics and Midnight Express was a very fast brawl. The World Tag Team title match, as I said, felt like the last 10 minutes of a 40-minute match. Uh, the Bardware match was quick and short. Even Francis Crockett got those names out there as quick as she could. So when these guys got out there and they didn't want to make a mistake, a mistake that could cost them the match, they were very patient, they were very deliberate, the intensity and the gravity of this entire show just changed. Everything was on the line here. It was very critical. Now, we're not going to review a 45-minute match move for move. That would take a while. No, but I will I will just give you quickly the overview of this, and then Vinny could talk about some big spots. So they went 45 minutes, and Ric Flair was a cardio machine. Him and Ricky Steamboat used to go in there for hour-long matches. They would try to blow each other up. Flair would just spend hours on that treadmill, just working his ass off. He can go. Sting was in there for 45 minutes, and he was right there with Rick the entire time. In fact, at the end of the match, the way the two worked the match, Flair sold it like he was more exhausted than Sting at the end. Yes. Sting had incredible cardio in this match. This guy would fire up with five minutes left, and he'd be jumping, and he'd be pounding his chest, and he'd be running. He was in fantastic shape. He did such a great job in this match. That's number one. Number two, this Flair Sting feud is legendary. Not sure you're aware of that or not. I seem to recall. Yes. One of the reasons that this is such a legendary feud was that it's the perfect dynamic. Flair is he's actually only 10 years older than Sting. It seems like he's like 15 or 20, but he's only 10. He is the old, grizzled veteran. Sting is the young, wild mare, not yet broken in. No. Just a complete sure. wild man. He could fire up like nobody's business. He'd run wild, but then he would do something stupid because he was young and dumb, mm-hmm. and Flair would take over again. It's like a timeless story. And, of Flair, course, they're always going to be 10 years apart, and so they could do this until Flair was like 50. Pretty much. And yes. younger and older. So Flair is... Dignity. His flair is all, and he'll he'll scream at you, and he'll brag, and he'll boast, but he's all about expensive suits and the high life and being better than other people. Whereas Sting is just unrestrained joy. <laughs> I mean, he's he is a ball of fire, and he just brings people along with him. So there's that contrast as well. Uh, they pace this match great. The, the, the number one reason, if you've never seen this match, and that you should go back and watch it, is. How to pace a 45-minute match without blowing up either man or the crowd? Well, hold on, Vinny. i got to disagree a little bit. All right. When I watched this match for the first, I'd say, five, six, seven minutes, I don't even think it was the first ten, I was watching this match, and I've seen a lot of long matches. I've been in two matches that went an hour, and I watched this match, and I thought, they're pacing themselves to go 45 minutes. Starting easy, starting slow. But you know what? By like the 10, 15-minute mark, by the 20-minute mark, by the 25-minute mark, they were working their asses off. Like, everybody talks about the Kenny Omega-Okada match that went an hour. And I think their their third match, if I recall, went even longer. But anyway, they've done two matches that have gone over an hour. And the thing about their match everyone talked about was, man, they worked like they were doing a 20-minute match. But they did it for 60 minutes. That's exactly what this match was. They worked their asses off for 45 minutes. It was crazy. They certainly did at points, but there was also points where they said, Sting, grab a headlock, and we're going to lay here in this match for five minutes. I don't know about five minutes, but they, they did five. No, dude, they did a five-minute headlock spot. Now, they weren't just lying there. It wasn't Dusty Rhodes. They would roll over for a two-cat and roll back over. And Flair would fight to his feet, but then it's going to ride back into a headlock. So they were doing stuff, but it was just a headlock for five minutes. There was a bear hug that lasted for five minutes. It started on the feet. It went to the mat. Flair's fighting. He's screaming, my back, my back. Yeah, but Flair was expending so much energy in that bear hug. He's screaming. He's flopping. He's. I just thought it was great. They made the most of these rest holds. I I will kind of disagree with that line and agree with your main point. They were not rest holds. They were working holds. 
Sure, they yeah. Were use, using holes to tell I'll a story. I'll accept that. Yeah. So, let's see. Uh, other points. There's, it's, it's every, it was, in fact, every Sting and Flair match you ever saw, just the first time they did it on TV. A hundred press slams, a hundred shoulder tackles, a hundred uh, beals out of the corner, drop kicks by Sting. Flair gave him everything. Everything that he did, Sting would turn it around over and over until he finally cut him off. Yes. Every, uh, cho- chopping the hell out of him. And, and it was funny because Sting doesn't throw chops, or at least he didn't th- then. So when Sting was throwing back, the, 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 the stiff punch of the day, uh, which, pr- you know, in modern times would probably be the European uppercut where you slap a guy, you know, you hit a guy with the elbow and your elbow just chest makes a lot of noise. In the 80s, it was the big overhand, clubbering, forearmed, like to the back of the neck and the shoulder. They're throwing a hundred of those to make a big, loud noise and get the crowd into it. So there were so many subtle things here. They went back and forth the whole time, and, and Flair sells for everybody and gets the heat. But everything Sting would do in this match, Flair would try to do, but it would not turn out as well. And vice versa, everything Flair did in this match, later Sting would do it, and he would do it better. So Sting at one point tries a body press, and he gets a two count out of, out of it. Ten minutes go by, Flair tries a body press, Sting rolls through, and Sting gets a two count out of it. Flair gets a figure four, and Sting sells for a while, and Flair's grabbing the ropes, but then Sting fires up, and he beats his chest, and he drags Flair to the ropes, and he turns Flair over, and now Flair's in trouble. And by the way, quick aside here, as Flair is selling, you know, the figure four is turned over, and Flair is selling and screaming, and Flair begs Tommy Young, pull my leg off! Pull my leg off! Yeah, he reversed it, but then he was stuck. He's stuck. So Tommy pulls his leg off as the ref is, because I think Flair eventually did get the ropes again. Tom, Tommy pulls his leg off, and very quietly, you can hear him, he shrugs and says, it's your hold. <laughs> you let go. Uh, well, let's see, what were some of the other ones? Uh, Flair did the shin breaker, later Sting did it. Oh, there's a big spot uh, where Sting... Does the big huge sunset or Flair did the big huge sunset flip and Sting fights and fights and he teeters and totters, then he beats his chest and he punches Flair in the face. And then a few minutes later, Sting tries the sunset flip and Flair has to grab the ropes, then he gets his hand kicked, he goes back. So even though none of this is the finish, you get the idea that everything Flair can do, Sting can do better. But everything Sting can do, when Flair tries it, he fucks it up. So for forty five minutes you were told Ric Flair is a tough bastard and he will not go down easy, but subtle, subtly by subtly, minute by minute, you realize Sting is the better man. So this goes on for a while. They brawl outside. Jason Hervey is guarding Patty Mullen with his life. <laughs> Made me laugh. Who, by the way, is, is looking with lust at the ring. Of course. At which point Jim Ross notes, I'm sure she's used to seeing some action. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually even better in delivery. I don't know if I can pull it off, but he mentions, I'm sure she's used to seeing some action. Not like this action. <laughs> Not like this action here in the NWA. Uh, let's see. What else happened in this? We had uh, Flair at one point pointed to a fan and said, I'll take your wife home, and Hervey and Patty both started laughing. So the big finish is... For the last five minutes of this, basically, Sting is just destroying him. Uh, he's taken everything Flair has to offer. He's come out of it stronger. Uh, you are correct. 45 minutes into this, Sting at all 270 pounds of him, uh, big, giant, jacked-up athlete. <laughs> there was a point in here where Sting did a standing splash, and I think Flair actually got the knees up, so it wasn't like a big point in the match. Sting jumped so high, it looked like he's coming off the top rope. He's just a freak in this match. So 45 minutes in, he looks none the worse for wear. He whips Flair across the ropes. Now, he's gotten the Scorpion once by this point, and Flair got the ropes, but he's not had the Stinger Splash all match. And with 30 seconds to go, he finally hits that splash, and he hooks in that Scorpion, and he sits down, and it's deep, and Flair is fucked. And Flair is screaming and wailing and crying, and Sting's cranking and cranking and cranking, and Flair somehow holds on and survives. The time limit expires. We go to the judges' scorecard. Flair has survived 45 minutes by the, literally by the skin of his teeth. Yes. You have no skin on your teeth, but literally by the skin of his teeth. If you were watching this match in 1988, you were left thinking, if this had been a 46-minute match, it's done. one. It's yes. over. And so we go to the judges. Because, now, everyone, 
There must. There must be a winner. There must be a winner there in this match. Must be a winner. First of all, as noted, Eddie Haskell and Jason Hervey don't even get to vote. Now, before you even go to the judges, Vinny, let's keep in mind, if this was real and you watched this match from beginning to end, how could you not score it for Sting? That's a great question. He dominated the entire match. Like, from start to finish, he dominated this match. He had the man in his unbreakable hold until the time limit expired. And by the way, not only did the time limit expire, but when it ended, Sting stood up and Ric Flair was dead in the middle of the ring for minutes on end through a commercial break. Yes. So, going in, how, how could you Uh, not score it? Perhaps there's a... There is a Greensboro pro wrestling scoring system that rewards a high number of points per chop thrown. Mm. It's the best I can do. No, there, there, there's no way to determine. Uh, like a st- Sting took everything Flair had to offer and, and had an answer for everything, and Flair had no answer for almost anything Sting did. So we go to the judges. And this is how the votes are announced. Patty Mullen votes for Ric Flair. God, I was, I was as mad when I heard that as I was when I heard that you saw to reduce John Jones' suspension. It was flat and out and out, absolute bullshit. And the camera cuts to Patty, and she smiles at Rick and waves. Dude, I hope that there must someone, be a follow up. Someone mentions what utter bullshit this is on the follow up show. I think, I, the, I think the story should come out that is a. As a response to this, Flair pulled some strings in Hollywood and got her the starring role in Frankenhooker. Yes. That's how this all got paid off. That would be so awesome. <laughs> oh, let's see. So Patty votes for Ric Flair. Gary Jester of the NWA Board of Directors votes for Sting. Of course he does. A wise man. Yes. And so we go to Sandy Scott, the final judge with the deciding vote. Does he vote for Flair? Does he vote for Sting? He votes for a draw. Wait a second. A draw? A draw. You're telling me these judges can score a 10-10 round? Uh, not A, a 10-10, 45-minute round. Dude. He watched 45 minutes of pro wrestling and could not determine in those 45 minutes whether one man was better than the other. So this guy knew going in that there must be a winner and he is one of three judges and his brilliant idea is to watch this match which sting clearly won and rule that in his mind it was a draw sting was furious afterwards rightfully furious the fans were furious he had been fucked like he'd never been fucked before this was bullshit but that was the idea Flair retains the NWA title. And you know what the moral of the story is? Everybody always says, this is a legendary match, and Ric Flair made Sting a star in one night. Absolutely correct. But what does that mean? I'm going to tell you what that means. Before this match started, when the guys are coming to the ring, Ric Flair just has this entrance. He's got his robe on. He's got his championship belt. He's got his hair all done up. He has that walk. He has that music. The crowd responds to him like an all-time legend. He gets in that fucking ring. He's the world champion. Out comes Young Sting. How long have we been watching Sting on this NWA TV show? Like, less than a year, right? Less than a year. He just showed up seemingly like a few months ago. And he was very popular, and he won all of his matches, and he was very, very charismatic. But before the match started... Even knowing everything I knew and everything that I know from having watched Sting and Flair for decades now. When the match started and I saw both those men in the ring, what I thought as a fan, having watched this NWA show on a weekly basis from the debut of Sting until today, what I thought was, it's too early for Sting to become the world champion. It's not like it is today where everybody gets the belt whenever. No, no, no. That's a very, very prestigious championship. And 
especially after the Ronnie Garvin fiasco, right? You watch the ring entrances. You watch those guys get in the ring, and your thought is, it's too early for Sting. Forty-five minutes later, it's just when it's over, you're like, dude, this guy could win the world title next week. He could win the world title in two weeks, in a month, whenever. And he will be the man when he gets that title. That's what you thought when this match was over. That's what Flair did for this guy in 45 minutes. It's unbelievable. Yeah. So, Like, there's nothing like that today. There's nothing like that where you take a guy that the fans kind of see as like a, a mid-card guy, and when it's over, you're like, he is he is a top guy. Even that Shawn Michaels, Shelton Benjamin match and stuff like that, it's like, man, that was a great performance by Shelton. But when that match was over, did you think, you know, Shelton ben- Benjamin could win the title tomorrow and he'd be like the biggest star in the business? Of course not. I can't even think of another match like this. It was unbelievable. Well, like gets into a long, con- long convoluted story about how the guy the fans want to believe in is not the guy the company wants to believe in, and we've been down that road a hundred times before. But yeah, uh, this show gets a thumbs up. I'll say it's pretty much as great as I remember. Yep, this uh, was a classic, classic professional wrestling television show. Yeah. So there you go. It was worth the wait. Up there on the WWE Network in the Clash of the Champions section, check it out. It's really easy to find. It's the first one. Yep, and when it was over, man, I cannot wait for next week's show when we get to watch the follow-up to this. That's right. I cannot wait for the follow-up. And more build for the Crockett Cup. That's right. Well, I, I...